2014's meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. Could everyone please make sure that the mobile phones are either off or at least switched to airplane or silent mode? Um, the first item of business today is the committee's second evidence session on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. Last week we took evidence from local authorities on the bill. This week we are taking evidence from the third sector. This and the other evidence sessions the committee has planned will be used to inform our evidence session with the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Margaret Burgess, on the 4th of November and ultimately the committee stage one report on the bill. I welcome our first round table uh, panel today. Uh, we are joined by Derek Young, Policy Officer of Age Scotland, or will be soon. Uh, Mark Ballard, the Head of Policy at Bernardo Scotland. Marion Davis, Head of Policy and Research at One Parent Family Scotland. Scott Robertson, Operations Manager at Quarriers, and Lynn Williams, Policy Officer for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organis Organisations. So welcome to you all. Um, some of you have taken part in these round table sessions before, but the idea is that we want to encourage interaction. Um, if you have any points that you want to raise, if you have any questions you want to ask of us, and the committee members will, will try and contribute with questions or observations, which we hope will allow us to, to gain as much evidence and information on this bill as we possibly can. Um, if he doesn't mind, I wanted to start with a question to Mark Ballard in terms of the Bernardo Scotland submission. Um, in the, the points that you raise, Mark, you, the first bullet point in your submission states that placing clear responsibilities on local authorities to promote awareness of and access to the Scottish Welfare Fund would be one way that it could be strengthened. I wondered if that responsibility should be put on local authorities, given that it's a Scottish welfare fund delivered by the Scottish Government. The, the local authorities are the agency for delivery. Now, clearly, they will have a responsibility to ensure that locally people are aware of where they can go. But surely the primacy in terms of making people aware of the Scottish welfare fund should lie with the Scottish Government. The Bernardo Scotland evidence was born out of talking to our staff who are working with vulnerable young people and families who are benefiting from the, the existing fund. Um, and the feeling talking to staff was that there, there's a patchy knowledge on the ground of the fund. In some areas, it's easier to access the fund than others. We'd highlight in particular issues around timescales for the fund, where some local authorities have done really well at trying to make the turnaround as short as possible so that you can access the fund within a day. Other local authorities, you may have to wait a couple of days or three days. That leaves our staff coping with a situation where they're working with somebody who needs support on Friday and there's no way that that support can come until the Monday or Tuesday. When you're talking about a family with children, that's, that's a very long time to wait. So there's something about the access arrangements at a local level. There's something about the information at a local <coughs> level and how it's disseminated through, through other services for, that work with vulnerable families like Bernardo's. But I, I would agree with you entirely that our early experiences show that there needs to be a strong national framework, there needs to be strong oversight, but we can't miss that there's also something about how it is implemented, how the access arrangements work on the ground, how the information is disseminated about how you access the fund on the ground that also needs to be taken care of. So I, f I fully agree that there are responsibilities that lie at a national level for a national framework, but as I say, the experience of our <coughs> services on the ground is that it can be patchy in terms of how easy the fund is to access. Uh, understandable. Do other uh, colleagues have any comments or anything they want to add? Or detract from what, what Mark has said? Not so far. Scott? Yeah. The point about it being patchy in the area to area, um, uh, national framework absolutely being um, essential. Um, and um, you know, the responsibility of local authorities, um, it's partly about um, good practice from area to area, ensuring that that's embedded um, and taken forward. Um, you know, in terms of quarries, have worked within a, a range of um, local authority areas, but I suppose particularly within youth homelessness, where it's limited areas perhaps we're in, but um, we do see um, a difference in terms of um, how the, the, the fund is being delivered in these areas. As frontline delivery agencies, you know, we've heard from, well it's anecdotal, we, we don't have statistical evidence to this uh, effect, but 
I think all of the, the committee members have experienced people telling them that they mistakenly uh, went to the DWP uh, because crisis loans and, and community grants were originally associated with the DWP um, and were not signposted to the, the local authorities by the DWP, although the DWP's own uh, officials say that staff are expected to do that signposting. Is that your experience or was it an experience that was occurring at the start but has dissipated now? Where people go to access different parts of the system. Um, I think in terms of access as well that um, there's the three channels. There's online, telephone and paper-based applications and I think we found that there are challenges around um, online and telephone. I mean, it can take up to 40 minutes to, to, do, to do a claim and some of our staff are saying, um, well, parents will come in and to our office and we'll support them to do the claim over, over the phone. Um, but for, for those who are not supported by organisations, um, it is challenging where maybe in an authority there's not really a face-to-face -face sort of support. You know, so for, you know, in Glasgow, for example, you can actually go somewhere and see someone. Um, so I think there's an issue around the paper-based claims and we would like to be more involved in you know, perhaps having access to paper-based applications and dealing with them through our organisation. Um, I mean, I think with, with online access, I mean, a lot of our parents don't have internet and um, you know, it's a bit of a struggle to go to the local library and you've got kids under five trying to um, submit a 40-minute claim form. Um, so I think there still are challenges around, around access. Linda, you wanted to make a comment or ask a question? Yes. Like that. And I just wondered um, what your experience was of the way that um, the initial application is dealt with. I suppose gatekeeping would be the catch-all phrase and how it moves on through the system and whether there are great variations amongst local authorities about that. Um, because I think it seems to be an issue from what I'm hearing locally and discussing with colleagues that there's a degree of confusion around how you go through the system. And following on from that, I would quite like to have your impressions of how that initial contact with the local authority leads on to perhaps other departments in the local authority being involved and indeed um, external agencies if required. So I know it's fairly new, but we have had two years now. Are we starting to see a joined up approach to the issue? Mark, I think I may have been directed at you. I, th I think um, Marion Davis from OPFS makes a really good point about uh, the difference between the young people we work with and other young people is that they have somebody who's working with them. So we ha Bernardo's has taken on staff who specifically work in um, welfare rights advice and are supporting some of the young people and families to cope with the increased pressure that's coming uh, through uh, greater benefit sanctions, more delays to benefit, um, that the, the effects of the, the recession. And so those are the people who are getting support and have somebody to help them and guide them through the gateways that are there. But I think, I think you're, uh, Linda Fabiani is quite right that it's not always a clear process, particularly if you don't have somebody there from a voluntary organisation, whether it's a specific organisation like Bernardo's or OPFS or Citizens Advice, to guide you through that process. But, but I, I would also like to highlight on a more positive note, um, Bernardo's really welcomes many of the elements in the draft guidance, particularly about things like... Um, decisions being communicated in writing and a clarity of a decision-making process. Those things are really helpful. Um, I think they will help to make the process clearer for everybody because they will act as a good national framework that you can then fit locally appropriate variations within. So there's a lot in the guidance which is helpful already. We'd like to see a bit more of that, but I think the guidance is the place that will help us deal with some of those kind of gatekeeping issues. Thank you. Do you want to 
There's a point. Uh, yes, Mr. Sanders, I've got a well, other questions if I may, Kavina. Yep, sure. Um, just picking up on this, I think a number of uh, submissions <coughs> talked about uh, the variation across Scotland in uh, the process. Um, and one of the criteria in which uh, the, the criteria has been set for um, administration has been uh, two days, a two day deadline for awarding grants. Uh, and a number of uh, submissions picked up on this. I think Quarriers, uh, Mr. Robson, you picked up on it in particular. He said that because um, the old uh, DWP gave one day, so it's a crisis. People got the grants immediately. And you pointed out that um, you know, if an application is received by a local authority on a Friday, payment at the end of the second working day is not really an effective response. Do you want to expand on that? In your experience, in um, for instance, in North Ayrshire, is that it's uh, our application is processed within one day, um, and within Glasgow, it will be well, two days. You know, in our concern, for example, um, well, a difference between one day or two days, but uh, you know, a Friday, someone which could be a Thursday evening. Um, so actually, if the application is made on a Friday and then it's maybe late on the Monday, you know, by definition, the crisis is. Um, you know, it's perhaps four days that a crisis, four or five days before the um, help with that crisis is being um, at, um, affected. Last week, the local authorities suggested that they needed the extra time to make further investigations, check the applicant's circumstances. It, it was a grant, not just a deduction from their loan. And secondly, that they provide a holistic service. It was more important to take longer about it. Is that, do you accept that? I mean, it's a crisis. I, I think that, you know, for instance, in supported youth housing um, projects where uh, a support worker may well be um, is likely to be supporting the young person to make the um, application. It still is the two days, um, for instance. Now, very positive from a youth um, housing project, and sorry, that's in Glasgow, very positive about um, feedback from youth housing managers met with them last week in relation to community care grants um, and uh, being night and day compared to what, what used to be. Um, but yes, that, in terms of crisis grants, that was a concern, um, and indeed, indeed putting some um, of our young people off applying for a grant, um, as was pointed out perhaps in terms of um, the, the, the crisis that they have that applying for the Thursday or Friday, um, if they're, they're not applying for it, there might be different reasons as to why they then decide that they don't actually need it for the Friday. But, um, in terms of, yes, um, that, that is a concern that it can, two days, when some local authorities are processing it within one day, and again, it's that lack of consistency. I don't know if others want to come in on that, but um, an another point uh, was also about the uh, local authorities' desire to, and, and the fact that it's not stipulated in, the, in this bill, uh, that awards should be made in cash, that it should be, in other words, no element of choice for uh, the applicants. Um, and I think a lot of submissions have talked about the stigma of uh, using either a card system or um, giving uh, assistance in kind, I think from Bernardo's and SCBU and many others and one parent families. Anyone do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, can, can I, yeah. Yeah, I think probably there's a few points I want to make. Uh, firstly, Ken's point around the stigma issue is something consistently members mention to us. I think, you know, the, the thing we, we submitted initially, the, the point of this is that people who are using the, the fund are people who are probably at crisis point anyway. It takes quite a lot of pride to come and ask for help for many families to not be able to provide for your family. I think, you know, suddenly you're in that position where you haven't asked for crisis help. So I think picking up from submissions that were given to the committee, I think the element of choice is absolutely critical, not partly for stigma, but also just generally to make sure we meet people's needs. So, for example, I mean, I don't want to steal Bill Slander from Inclusion Scotland, but I mean, I, I, at events with Inclusion Scotland and others, where we have a lack of choice in what's provided, then actually it doesn't actually meet people's needs and it's actually more cost effective to have worked with the family to work out what that need is. So you provide, for example, and there's examples from uh, Child Poverty Action Group and others, where a good provided actually doesn't fit, doesn't meet someone's needs, so it's going back, having to reapply. So there's a whole element of time and money wasted in a system that isn't actually responding to what people actually need. Um, I guess a number of issues to pick up in earlier points are around access to the system um, and the lack of face-to-face -face applications I think would be a concern. Um, the other issue is, is around equality access generally. So if you are deaf and hard of hearing, have a learned disability, you know, phone access, even online access can be difficult. So the face-to-face -face element is important. Um, the issue of gatekeeping um, certainly is something we're picking up consistently across a number of members is that... It, 
is it down to training? Is it down to understanding what a client actually needs? So one example we were given was um, provision of a specialist piece of equipment, um, which actually would prevent someone from moving into care. But it's uh, being told that actually it's just a white good you can apply for in terms of community care grants. So it's that kind of understanding of how the system operates and um, what actually meets clients' needs. I think also there's, there's still a bit of a hangover from the social fund. Certainly from speaking to activists and others, people still feel there's, there's a bit of stigma for applying to, to, for a crisis grant or, a, or some kind of like. So people are, are maybe genuinely, genuinely a bit unwilling to apply for the fund, even if they know it exists, because there's still a bit of stigma attached, attached to that. Um, and I think, lastly, I think the, the element of choice is important. A number of members and of colleagues in the third sector have mentioned the element of choice about having something that actually meets your needs. Um, Certainly the cash versus in kind argument is, is, is a fresh and a live one. But ultimately it's about around, because someone is in crisis doesn't mean they should be treated any less well or with less respect. So if they're needing something, they need to buy something, actually it may make sense for them to have that choice. Um, and actually in some cases it's actually maybe more cost effective for them to go and buy something that actually meets their needs and is better quality. Um, so there's a whole... There is a lot of issues around this, but for us and certainly for other third sector or, uh, members, it's around choice rather than actually, well, here's what you're having. You either like her lump it and on you go. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yep. They've touched on some of the points that Lynn made, and um, I think we gave an example of um, uh, some young parents in North Lanarkshire, the choice of a carpet was a blue or was it blue or green? No, it wouldn't be blue or green. It must be blue. It wouldn't be blue. Um, and so, therefore, when friends come round, they know right. You've got your carpet from the welfare fund, and it's a bit it's demeaning. Obviously, it's better than having no carpet. But um, I think it's a question of choice. I think for and I think in, uh, other submissions from local authorities. They have said, you know, there's a plus to in kind because it can create jobs or it can um, it can make it easier for the the, the person involved. But I think, um, well, certainly from the parents we work with, they would like to to have the choice um, and to have the dignity to, to be able to make that choice. Um, so just really supporting what Lynn has said there about that. You want to do? Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. Um, well, in our written submission, we also made the point about cash versus in kind. We certainly can envisage circumstances where giving goods specifically might well address a very direct need in a very immediate way. But as a general rule, a voucher system carries with it a great risk of uh, stigma, um, particularly for um, older people in our view, because very often they tend to be quite protective and private about their finances. They're not... Um, uh, forthcoming or willing to discuss them openly with other people, which creates another, other problems elsewhere in the application process. Um, but in, in relation to some of the other issues you also mentioned about the, uh, uh, how, people, how flexible people find the system to access, um, there are also issues about the application of the capital rules and whether there's any flexibility applied to those. For example, people who are paid pensions, pension-related benefits such as pension credit and, and wages, they obviously come in at a certain point of the fortnight or, or the month. Uh, you don't know when a crisis is going to strike, but it may be that it so happens at the point that it does. You, you, you have less money coming in than you expected, but bills are going out in two days' time. That is a, a crisis situation, but effectively you might not qualify under a strict application of the capital rules. So there, it, I, we have some evidence that different local authorities um, are applying those rules differently as to whether they apply any flexibility to take account of that type of circumstance or not. Um, but the main issue for us is that older people simply are not applying at the rates that um, other age groups and, and social demographic groups are, and that's covered in our written submission. We have a number of suggestions as to why that might be happening. People might be put off. They might be getting inaccurate advice. Um, but it is worrying from our point of view that although older people may well qualify, and they may well have a strong case to make. The, you know, the, the median age of awards being made are all in the mid-30s, whether it's crisis or community care grants. Kevin. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think you know, I think we went over in some depth the cash versus um, goods scenario last week um, with councils, some of whom uh, who had the view that um, goods could often mean uh, uh, getting stuff procured cheaper, which meant that the money went further so that the funds themselves uh, were uh, manageable over the piece. 
And I just wonder, um, convener, if in some of these cases that common sense should apply. Um, Marion talked about a particular colour of carpet. Now, if folk had the choice within the procured goods of the council of different colours, then maybe that's uh, a scenario that would work and is, is, in my mind, complete common sense. Or the cooker that was mentioned in, in uh, one of the submissions as well. Rather than having one choice of cooker, which isn't a get a fit in a particular area, why can folk not actually choose? Um, and beyond that, I wonder if folk could give their opinion um, about uh, situations such as in Aberdeen, where often money is loaded on to uh, the Accord card there rather than the voucher system. Um, and thus far, you know, the Aberdeen Accord card has actually helped to reduce stigma um, because, for example, every kid uh, pays for their school meals using the Accord cards, whether they're on free meals or whether they're paying for them. So there are ways, I think, of striking the right balance between all of these things to maximise the amount of awards that can be made. And I just wonder, in terms of, of, of folks' opinions, whether if we could reach that balance, that right balance, that common sense approach, that you know that there can be a, a mix situation where folks still have choice, uh, but you know, we're maybe able to procure more. Anyone want to take that up? I, yeah, can you say, I mean, certainly, within this sort of context of, um, as I mentioned before, young people moving on from, young homeless people moving on from supported accommodation, um, it, it, it was <coughs> hoped that when um, the welfare fund was set up, that in terms of th there would be, you know, the point that the council was made about being able to have, to be able to purchase greater levels of furniture. Um, our experience in some local authorities' areas is that um, it was like night and day speaking to project managers in terms of young people are, um, what previously used to be the case is they were catch-22 situation, they either needed to wait um, till they got their community care grant, which took many weeks, in which case they weren't move, able to move into their new tenancies and were um, getting a lot of rent arrears, or they moved in straight away into their new tenancy, but um, had no furniture um, at all, so didn't get any, you know, got the housing benefits straight away, um, didn't get rent arrears, but had no furniture. This seems, to, the, the current um, community care grant seems to be, in particular in some areas, enabling young people to be able to move in straight away with a furniture package. Um, a, a, a good furniture package with, with some choice to it in, in some of the areas. Um, now, the, now, the advantages that that outweighs in terms of um, clearly what is your suggestion that there, there could and should be more choice and that the choice um, seems to be greater in some local authority areas than, than what it is. But a very important point, I think, you know, in, in one of our local authority areas, ab absolutely, when a young person who's in supported accommodation is passed for housing um, or is acknowledged that they're going to be getting housed, that application for the community care grant can be made straight away and then um, once they're housed, they then they, they get the furniture straight away. In other local authorities, it's still waiting um, until the young person signs for a tenancy. So there's still a potential um, de de delay there. Um, and this is an advantage of, of the new system, that it can be that um, applications can be made. Um, you know, that young people are, are, are in, it might be quarries or other accommodation, but it's in partnership with the, the local authority that have been accepted as being homeless and going to be housed. So applications could and should be made at that point. Um, I have one Kevin, question. Yep, you want to ask Con a convener on a, a, a different topic. Uh, and that's round about um, uh, the care leaver situation. And obviously, um, Parliament has paid pretty close attention uh, in, in how to, to deal with what are often uh, fraught situations where um, folk don't have the support networks that, that many of us have. Um, and uh, Bernardo's and others have, have mentioned uh, care leavers in their submission and how um, uh, often care leavers are, are sanctioned more than others and, and have to access the, the welfare funds uh, more than others. Um, I wonder if we could get general comment about uh, how folks feel care leavers are treated in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund. And beyond that, uh, I would be interested to hear how folk think that this and other funds would be impacted if uh, the UK government goes ahead with withdrawing housing benefit and, and other benefits uh, to, to young folk. 
In particularly on that point, um, looking at while um, Bernardo Scotland welcomes the, the draft bill and urges the committee and the parliament to fully back the bill, we are concerned about some of the language, particularly in um, 2.2a of the bill, where it talks about qualifying individuals means individuals who have been or without the assistant might otherwise without assistance might otherwise be in prison, hospital, a residential care establishment or other institution. Now residential care establishment seems to us to be problematic language and not in keeping with the vision for supporting looked after young people and formerly looked after young people set out in the Children and Young People Scotland Act, where there's now a much greater emphasis on the corporate parenting responsibilities that local authorities and other public bodies hold towards formerly looked after young people, whether they were in residential care, in foster care, in other community placements such as kinship care with friends or family, or indeed looked after at home. And we would like to see greater alignment between what's in the Welfare Funds Scotland Bill and what was in the Children and what was it, what's in the Children and Young People Scotland Act, where there's a recognition that all formerly looked after young people under the age of 26 should be able to uh, should be deemed qualifying individuals. And we think that that integration between the two pieces of legislation would be really helpful in making sure that form formerly looked after young people didn't slip through the cracks. I know Duncan Dunlop from Who Cares Scotland will also be talking about <coughs> some of these points in, with respect to care leavers, but residential care establishment we don't think is particularly contemporary language, and we'd like that, that vision of the responsibilities we owe to all formerly looked after young people to be properly reflected in this piece of legislation. It's in the effects on care leavers and young folks without support networks. As, as I've, in previous evidence to the committee, I highlighted that Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act, uh, while it reserves welfare powers in general to Westminster, makes a specific exemption for benefits and support and welfare that is given to uh, young adults by virtue of their status as former, formerly looked after young people. So we think it's important that that is reflected, that even whatever the debate that takes place with regard to the extension of further powers over <coughs> welfare to the Scottish Parliament, there is an existing power within the existing legislation that enables support to be given to formerly looked after young people by virtue of their status as formally being looked after. And that we would... We'd like to see that awareness um, in this legislation and in the general way that local authorities work. And so that approach, we think, is, is crucial to recognise that whatever happens in terms of welfare, there are existing powers, there are existing obligations as corporate parents, and we want to see that borne out in all the decisions that local authorities take. Um, firstly, I think section 2.2, there's, there's a number of concerns from across the third sector around the wording in that section and potentially how it might exclude other groups. I know that Bill Scott and others, will, 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 and others I think Marion, have called for amendments to that section around families under exceptional pressure and particularly people with disabilities. So I think they need to be careful about the language that's used in that section. It doesn't exclude people by dint of just being so so tight. Um, so certainly SCVO would support a number of amendments that have been support, put forward by third sector colleagues on that to look at what that wording says and to make sure that we aren't, you know, how it, the fund then translates into operation actually becomes so tight that people are not being able to have access to that. Um, to pick up on Kevin Stewart's second point about the impact of announcements made last week, um, this is probably I was going to say in a closing statement, so I'm probably preempting myself here, but um, I think that many of us are concerned about the announcements last week. Um, we already know, and there's significant evidence, and, and SCV was about to publish some research again, which shows the impact of welfare reform in families across, across Scotland and the UK. Um, so our call would be to, to all parties, to civil society and others, maybe perhaps a summit, summit immediately, as soon as possible, to begin to look at the impact of what's been announced on this fund and other policies, because what we're going to experience 
I think will be pretty horrific. It's bad enough just now we know what the impact has been. So I think that as collectively we have to look at what these announcements actually mean, how it will affect families, the impact on the fund, which is why we call for a review clause in, in the bill to, to make sure that we, we understand the changing context in which this, this fund operates. Um, but to prepare for what's coming. I think, you know, it's bad now. It's going to be a heck of a lot worse. So I think that we need to sort of begin to look at what collectively Scottish Government, COSLA, third sector and others can do around this. We have the budget this week, the draft budget this week. What are we doing around that? Um, and are there collective actions we can do around the welfare fund, whether we can increase it or whether there's other things we can do in terms of policy that I think to prepare for what, what we know is coming over the next, the next year or so. It's around about a quarter of all um, claims to the community care um, fund is from lone parents. And I think the point I wanted to make was that it's not always for reasons of because there's an emergency. I think there's a recognition that the benefit system, you know, the rates are too low. People are living on benefits below the poverty line. Um, they have not just emergency costs, there's intermittent costs that you have. If you've had a a washing machine for so long or you've had a cooker for so long, it burns out. You cannot pay for that out of your regular money, which you live on um, every week. Um, and uh, the, the um, announcements that have been made, um, of course, are going to have an incredible detrimental effect on um, families with children. Um, the welfare fund, in a sense, and this was a point made by the officials, um, has a particular role, in a way, a sticking plaster to a welfare system that's broken, um, that doesn't provide a safety net um, and uh, actually leaves uh, people in, uh, you know, kind of, uh, in severe hardship. Um, and we can only look ahead to a situation where that's going to get a lot worse um, and put immense pressures on the welfare fund. Um, so I think, yes, what we have at the moment will probably not suffice to meet the needs um, to tackle the child poverty that we know is going to be massively increasing and I think it's predicted you know, by 2020 to increase um, rather than reduce, which the present government said um, <coughs> they would achieve er uh, eradication of by 2020. Um, as the, the conversation is wider, I wanted to make some, some further points. Um, I think uh, uh, Bernardo Scotland and NSPCC Scotland recently published a report looking at the experience of our family support services across Scotland. And across Scotland, we're seeing increasing number of families who are really struggling to cope with extreme levels of hardship, often linked to benefit sanctions, uh, linked to, to delays in payments, linked to the increased cost of living and the increased cost for basic essentials. And that's happening now. That's the reality now, regardless of what might happen after the, the, the next UK election. And that's why, um, while I've made, I made comments previously about Section 2.2, I think um, along the same lines as, as Marion Davis, there are some things that could be improved in Section 2.1. Um, at the moment, um, the, the short-term need is, is described as arising out of an exceptional event or exceptional circumstances. Many of the families we work with are under uh, what I would describe as exceptional pressure. That's a long-term pressure. It's a pressure that may come from a benefit sanction of three months or six months um, or even um, a, a period of years for a family member. So we would like to see um, that wording extended beyond events or circumstances into exceptional pressures as well. And I know um, CPAG Scotland has also um, made that point. Equally, in the, the definition looks at the risk to the well-being of an individual. Um, as I'm sure Marion would agree, for many families, the well-being risk is also about the, the well-being of the dependents of that individual. So extending that definition to go beyond just the well-being of an individual, but also to include the well-being of of dependents, I think again would align this bill better with the purposes of the Children and Young People Scotland Act. And that will be a helpful link between the, the very positive vision of welfare, uh, of well-being and Scotland being the best place in the world for every child to go up and this legislation to help support that at times of exceptional pressure for families. Jamie. 
Thank you, uh, convener. In uh, the submissions from the organisations before us, I think everyone uh, supported the Ombudsman as the body to conduct second tier views, except for the SEU, maybe a bit more neutral on it. Last week we heard uh, some concern from local authorities before us about uh, this approach, although I think one of the local authorities, I can't remember which one, it did accept there might be difficulties in them having a significant enough caseload to build up expertise. And Aid Scotland made this, the point, that's why they support the SPSO. But I suppose it's just a general question. Why, why do the organisations think it should be the Ombudsman that conducts second tier reviews? Convener, Mr Hepburn mentioned uh, our submission, so I thought I'd better respond. Um, yes, I mean, f the ambition that was stated by the Scottish Government when the Scottish Welfare Fund was created on a non-statutory basis was that the funds should be locally administered, but that there should also be a national consistency. And we are very firmly of the view that if there is no uh, ability at a Scotland-wide level to have second-tier review, then there really is no structural dynamic to try and ensure that level of consistency. Um, we accepted the point that uh, the other option, which was put in the consultation paper of a, a tribunal, uh, could lead to further delay, it could be more expensive, it could be more off-putting, actually, for applicants if it had very formal procedures. But that's not the experience of people who contact the Ombudsman. Um, we, we hope that the consistency would be promoted by, in the same way as, for example, the Information Commissioner has developed a body of decisions that he has made and she has made um, to... Uh, encourage authorities to whom the freedom of information legislation applies to act in accordance with the body of decisions that have been built up. We, we can see that there is a, a similar possibility to try and develop that um, consistency. And I know that the local authorities made a point about this was an added complication factor for them to be able to manage the funds appropriately. Um, but it doesn't seem to be, and seem to us to be, uh, the sort of problem which is uh, one that local authorities could not cope with because they have to apply and manage the implementation of national legislation which is nationally applied with a local budget uh, in many different areas. And this, this might would be no different from many other areas that local authorities have that responsibility. Matt? Uh, yes, I, I fully support what Derek Young has just said. Um, I think the, the most important thing for us is how we can ensure that the learning from reviews by SPSO is actually used to improve the practice of local authorities and not just, as Derek Young described, the local authority in which the, the review was, was particularly relevant, but across the board. And that, we see, is the great virtue of having that overall review structure, that it enhances learning, it en enhances the dissemination of best practice models being taken up across the board. Unless other uh, witnesses have something to add. Case okay, so, of, you know, recognising the experience of our third sector colleagues on this, I think what we agree uh, across the board and support colleagues in is that there needs to be that independent second tier, something that's independent, that, as, as Derek and I'll say, is, is there's, there's learning from that. I think the point we made was around things like accessibility, the timescales for, for appeals as well, that, you know, for example, social care reviews, for example, can take a heck of a long time, so that the process is, is, is as quick as it can be. And I understand the SPSO colleagues recognise that, that is, that's an issue. So accessibility, the learning point and the evaluation and making sure that we're learning from bad practice and good practice is important too. But we would certainly you know, support members' views on that, 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 that if this is the, the best option we have, then you know, that we need to make, make sure that actually works effectively as possible. But from the applicant's perspective, it's as accessible and easy to get to as possible too. Oh, sorry. It's um, important that um, claimants are represented by a welfare rights officer, that um, they can give further evidence to, put, to support the case and they're given the option of a face-to-face -face hearing, just to add to what other colleagues have, have said, which we support. I'll maybe come back to this later, but I want to bring Annabelle in. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning uh, to everyone. Um, I, had, uh, I wanted to pick up a point uh, made a while back, but I'll start with a, a new point, which I don't think we've touched on yet, which is the issue of, of uh, the, the e uh, basic ethos of the, the Welfare Fund, which is, uh, as drafted, a grant making fund. And uh, I, I note many comments in your submissions about that, that uh, it seems that you welcome that, but have concerns. 
<clears throat> about some of the language used, which some might have interpreted as being to do with being able to claw back funds in terms of fraudulent claims. But it would be interesting to hear, firstly, on the basic point, grants versus loans, and secondly, on why you have concerns about the language currently uh, in the, the draft bill. Oh, okay, it's fine. <laughs> Lady colleagues. Um, yeah, I think, I think across the board, certainly looking at uh, colleagues' submissions on their own, is that um, the, the, the approach the Scottish Government have taken in terms of grants is far favourable, favourable, I think, in terms of having a loan-based approach. Um, for many of the reasons that Marion suggested around people, you know, that these are people who are at absolute crisis, to think ahead about actually, you know, how I'm going to pay this loan back is, is a big, big issue. Um, so I think certainly across the sector there would be a view that the grants are far preferable. How you then how you then make that award happen, whether it's a voucher versus grant, I think the cash versus kind argument we've already kind of rehearsed already. Um, I think certainly our concern around the language, we picked up on child poverty action groups response around um, withdrawal of funds or reclaiming of funds. Um, and certainly looking at the evidence from last week, my concern would be, are we starting from a position that people are going to, are going to fraudulently claim from the system or not? So I think, you know, we need to make sure that we're not unintentionally giving a message that says, actually, do you know what, we're going to fraud the system from the very beginning. So I think, you know, to say that, have that in the bill, that actually you're going to be able to reclaim the funds assumes a position of fraud. And we know that fraud, in terms of the benefit system, is already a tiny proportion of that. So I think it's, it's unintentional messages around what, what are we seeing here. You know, this is a fund that's the absolute basic of safety nets. People come here when they're in absolute crisis and need some real support. So the idea of dignity and respect, and certainly we've called um, in our submission um, that in some way the bill reflects that, that ethos. We talk a lot in Scotland about creating a different approach to welfare then we need to make sure the language we use in the bill reflects that, that actually what we're doing is a slightly different approach, it's far more caring, we actually recognise people need support and that we shouldn't be stigmatised for that. So I think in terms of the language used and how that filters through to both regulation and operation is incredibly important. And we would certainly call for, I don't know how you do it, but certainly upfront principles around the bill that says actually this is a rights-based approach, that actually when people come to this, 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 this fund that actually they can't afford to meet the most basic of your rights, such as food and shelter, then how they're treated is absolutely critical and dignity and respect must be at the heart of that, I think. Yeah, I said, but I think the key point is that if there is going to be a section in 5.2.F that talks about circumstances where monies have to be repaid, that needs to be balanced by something on the face of the bill that defines the fund um, as uh, a grant-making fund, not a repayable loan-making fund, to balance out and clarify exactly what that reference to monies being repaid means. Um, and I think more widely, um, and I know this committee and the Parliament have always been supportive of the role of credit unions, and credit unions are the kind of positive model if we're looking for repayable loans to support families. However, as Lynn Williams says, this is a, a crisis fund for exceptional circumstances. And I think it's important to main, maintain that distinction. Yeah, there's a question. We um, very much supported the grant um, model um, rather than loans. Um, and in discussions with Scottish Government officials and I think in the evidence at the last session um, when um, representatives were asked about what the evidence base was for fraud um, uh, there wasn't really any clear evidence base that kind of came through to me in the evidence it may be anecdotal cases um, which potentially you may always get but there is no evidence of widespread fraud or reselling of goods on a massive scale um, and on meeting the officials, they agreed that that was the case. Um, so I think, as Lynn said, in terms of the, the kind of feel of the, of the fund itself and the fact that, you know, it's important, it's a rights-based approach and, you know, we are um, dealing with those who have been, you know, kind of on the lowest level of benefits and um, unless there's some evidence of um, widespread fraud, then uh, I think... Uh, the rights-based approach is, is, is the correct one. 
Um, it should be on the face of the bill as well. I, I just wanted to make a very short point which reflects some of the points that others have made. Um, that we, we didn't specifically address the grants versus loans questions in our written submission, but uh, it, it does reflect the culture and the level of expectation that you set around the operation of the scheme, uh, which is a point that Lynn Williams made. Um, we, in our experience, we've found that older people have what we've described as a propensity for thrift. They will quite often use goods uh, much longer than uh, other people would consider to be their useful life. Um, so to the point where they actually identify a need in something is really unusable. Um, that, that is a, a considerable point to have reached and that therefore at that level and at that stage uh, a, a grant system makes much more sense in terms of being able to reflect the fact that you're getting maximum use out of, of goods anyway uh, and that this is a sort of more direct replacement like for like um, situation which the, the fund can support. To, to come back to an important issue that was raised a wee while earlier, I was trying to catch your eye but I didn't succeed, um, on terms of access and awareness. In terms of access, um, uh, Marion uh, mentioned that it would be useful to have forms issued uh, in the way that apparently is happening already as far as social work uh, departments are concerned. And I just wonder if we could explore that further. Can we clarify whether it is the case that no local authority issues any forms and why don't they? If that would actually help the process, why is that not already happening when there's precedent in other parts of the, the relevant local authority? Because I think that would be a very important point to address because access is, is key in the end of the day. Does anybody have any information on that? Because it's online, people can download it. Um, Marine, I, it's, it's rightly said that you shouldn't make that assumption. What, what certainly we've picked up is that um, I suspect probably people have got copies of forms. Some organisations will have that, but there's an assumption that, you know, for example, local charities will just download that and you know have batch forms and you know print that. I don't know whether you can say anything about that, but mm -hmm. certainly, again, it's and we made this response is that the impact again on the third sector is that they're expected to take on these costs and pull pull these things down. And most frontline organisations think we will we'll probably do that. Um, but the assumption that everything is online, therefore everyone has access, I think, is one that has to be challenged. Um, certainly, I know certainly some organisations have said that they've been timed out or that it's frozen when they've been online and if you have to go back and repeat the whole thing again. And as with online, it doesn't always work. So there are issues around. I think access generally has to be looked at. I know the Scottish Government are aware of that, but I think there are wider equality issues around this as well that have to be looked at in terms of phone access as well. Yeah, I think our experience is that um, the system is working well in a sense because they support workers who are used to supporting um, young people to make uh, um, applications. But you know, if you, if you didn't have that inbuilt um, sort of, you know, and this is young people who are in supported accommodation, so, and so there's good working relationships built up with the relevant department within the local authorities. But yeah, in terms of publicity, in terms of people access to, to forms and um, how we'd find that, I think that, um, th 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 that would be difficult, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't actually know if I'm asking the right people, to be honest. It was just a couple of things that have been said just, just struck a chord with me. And then Lynn again, when she talked about assumptions, and that there seems to be quite a lot of assumptions made in the operation of this kind of fund. And one of the ones that perhaps bothers me is almost an assumption that people who will utilise this fund or try to utilise this fund may in some degree already be in the system. And I mean, I can see from um, Derek Young's submission about the elderly uh, that there is a view, for example, that they're not only much more reluctant to perhaps approach this kind of fund, but some of the language may well be off-putting. And it's, it's perhaps just to get it in record that the committee can look at. Um, is the language such that we all use that there's a bit of an assumption that folk are already in the system? What can we do to <clears throat> make sure that those who hit hard times perhaps for the first time in their life and have never been involved with any agencies or anything know that there may well be something that they can tap into that could help for this one-off crisis. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you to the, for the question. Um, 
It is our experience that quite often older people will not um, be in ready contact with other uh, forms of professionals who are in the habit of giving advice about the availability of the funds and the criteria to be applied and the guidance and the regulations, for example. Um, so if once you attain your state pension age, you know, you, the, the, the way that state pension is administered, that's through the pension service, that money could be paid directly into your bank account. It might be still accessed through the post office, but neither of those routes are ones which come with uh, ready knowledge or uh, advice about accessing the funds. Similarly, um, you might have no reason at all to contact the local authority social work um, department. So it might be a, a, a group of people in a, in a sort of professional area that's entirely unfamiliar to you. Um, and the people who you do come across, who are health and social care professionals, for example, might have no knowledge or poor knowledge. They might have inaccurate advice to give. Um, so we're obviously an information and advice provider ourselves at Age Scotland. We um, try and cover some of that gap, but we can't obviously reach everyone. So the point that you made about language is actually very important. And although I know colleagues have made specific recommendations for changes in the language of the bill or language of the regulations, um, certainly that would help in terms of an example you mentioned was families suffering under exceptional pressure. Well, that does apply as a criteria to an older person living alone. But they may believe, A, that they're not a family, and they may have a different level of social expectation as to what exceptional pressure um, constitutes. Um, so it's really important that in, in the information and advice that's published about the availability of the funds, which supports the legislation once the legislation's in place, that it is much more accessible and inclusive and approachable, if you like, in the way that it doesn't dissuade people. Because as I mentioned previously in, in my evidence, for older people, the dissuasive effect seems to, to be a significant one because of the low levels of applications that are being made by older people, even although once they do apply, the rates of success that they have are reasonably high. Okay. Small point. Thank you. It's very relevant when you look at the percentage of children that are in poverty, you know, a high percentage have one parent who's working, who maybe haven't been in the system in any way whatsoever. Uh, if you look at food banks and people that are using food banks, often it's the people who are actually in work. Um, so there's a whole pool of people who have been pulled into the system, so to speak, who weren't involved before because of welfare reform and the things that are impacting on, parent, on, on, on families um, um, and the cuts. So I think we are pulling in uh, people who maybe you know, haven't been in the situation that they're in before. I would agree with, with everything that Derek Young and Marion Davis have said, but the, the final point I was going to add is there's often a discussion of the role of the third sector in this. And when we say third sector, that can mean an organisation like Bernardo's, which has staff with specialist knowledge of this and internal systems. It can also mean community groups, church groups, sports clubs, a whole wide variety of organisations who may have a relationship with uh, some of the people that, that Derek Young talked about, but don't see themselves as organisations that, or aren't seen as organisations that need this kind of information. So when we think about the role of the third sector in supporting um, awareness and supporting access, we need to think about the breadth of the third sector, not simply focus on uh, the organisations like Bernardo's, which already have that knowledge, because the third sector is much broader, and it's some of those organisations like the sports club which may be the, the point of contact that somebody needs. Uh, thank you, Vera. Um, just uh, picking up some of the themes here, um, I, I think uh, clearly it's essential, given that the UK government has devolved uh, crisis and community care grants, it's essential that the uh, Scottish government put in place a scheme and uh, put it in, 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 on statute to provide those um, resources where needed. I think I was surprised, picking up some of the comments there, that um, we haven't taken advantage of this moment to perhaps uh, address some of the um, feelings that we see in the overall welfare system and to adopt some of the principles that we've been talking about in recent years uh, about a rights-based approach. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that most surprised me, I think, because uh, there's a few sort of, I would say, I suppose, mistakes. This is not a radical bill. This, this bill essentially just replaces the old system with a very, mm -hmm. very slightly altered similar system. What really surprised me was this clause that allows services to be outsourced or privatised. Um, I, I thought this was a very strange approach, given that we want, I think,
think local authorities to adopt a holistic approach. Um, I think Bernardo's, uh, or Ballard, um, was one of the, I think several organisations picked up on it, but I think you commented on this mm. idea that you know, whether or not outsourcing such a provision would be desirable or not. I think that um, the point we would make is that there need to be very clear guidelines on suitability. They need to be set out in regulations. Um, third sector providers may be able to support, but they have to demonstrate very clearly that they understand the vulnerabilities of the people involved. But I think there's a, a challenge across the system that um, Scott Robertson and I both referred to the fact that um, the regulations talk about working days. And if, if you're making an application on a Friday and two working days away is next Tuesday, that's a very long time to wait. And I know that Bernardo's, I imagine other organisations have shifted, started to shift more and more of their services so that they often offer support seven days a week rather than just in the working week. And that, I think, is perhaps part of the role in terms of finding ways to support people even when it's not a working day. And that, that, I think, is part of the role that the third sector can help to deliver. But as I said, there have to be clear guidelines on suitability. They have to be set out in the regulations. But there may be areas where third sector organisations can support the effective delivery of some of this. Marion from One Parent Families, whether you agree that it's something, it needs to be slightly clearer what is meant by outsourcing. <laughs> Um, certainly in our submission, uh, we did note that and um, it would open up the door to contracting out to private companies as a possibility. Um, and based on kind of the evidence um, within contracting out to the private sector, you know, within the welfare system, evidence shows that you know, it hasn't been that successful. Um, we feel there's a conflict of interest. It has led to poor outcomes. The work programme, very poor outcome. We know the situation with ATOS and all that was involved in that. So um, we felt that, um, that uh, as with in other areas of delivery, that um, it may result in a lack of uh, democratic accountability. So we weren't really in favour of, um, of that clause. And in fact, I think in our submission we asked or we recommended that um, it be withdrawn. <laughs> If you can. One of the comments that you made in the SEVU submission it highlighted that uh, the, the, the high number of decisions, appeals, in other words, that are successfully challenged, when we heard evidence uh, on this, you, in fact, you made the comparison between the successful level of appeals and compare that to the successful, it, it's a higher level of successful appeals than there is against benefit sanctions. Mm -hmm. Now, when we heard evidence on this, in this very committee about benefit sanctions, we used that as evidence that the benefit sanction system was uh, not working. We used it as forcefully. Okay. Um, I was surprised. What, what, point, what conclusions can we withdraw? Can we draw from your evidence here? I think maybe you're comparing oranges and lemons. I don't know, but I think I think what struck me looking at the um, the stats for last year was that there, although there's a, a low number of people appealing decisions in the fund, the number of appeals that are successful or decisions that are changed is relatively high. Um, and I think it comes back to some of the discussion we've had around discretion, around how decisions are made, you know, perhaps people aren't getting what they want or the, the, what they need, or, you know, that, that people are being gatekeeped out of the system. So I think what the point we wanted to make around that was, you know, 50% plus turnaround of decisions seems relatively high to me. Um, so what's happening in the decision-making process? Is it discretionary enough? Is it flexible enough? Does it recognise people's needs? Um, although the levels of, of actual reviews are still relatively low compared to, I think you're talking three figures as opposed to the previous fund. Um, so for us, it was to say, well, actually, you know, um, people are challenging this and they're challenging the, 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 the decisions that are made that are overturned are, are relatively high. So it was more just to say, look, there's, there's something you need to keep an eye on. What's going on in the decision-making process? Are the decisions the right ones? Are people being gatekept out of the system? Or do we need to think about, you know, you know what kind of what decisions are staff making in the front line in the first place? And why are so many reviews overturned? Uh, convener, uh, it's an interesting uh, line of, uh, of discussion there. 
And one of the things which we heard last week in evidence from uh, the lady from Aberdeenshire um, was that often during the case of uh, the time between the original decision and the appeal that much more information is forthcoming uh, to ensure that uh, the, the folks get uh, what's required. And I wonder if maybe the difficulty is not necessarily um, a, a difficulty about the wrong decision uh, being made, but a decision being made based on the information at that time. And I wonder if there is any way um, that the system could be improved so uh, the folks at the front line are getting all of the information they possibly can at the initial stage rather than waiting for appeal. We had when we've been looking at the, the ATOS uh, system, you know, the, the amount of times that we were told that the reason why decisions were overturned later on uh, was because information that hadn't been available at the outset is now available. So, you know, when you're looking at the work capability assessment, you're looking at the sanctions, and then you're looking at the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. Clearly, getting information at the outset is, is vital. So how do we improve that? I think is, is the question. Yeah. In terms of ATOS, we've had the numerous uh, Harrington reviews and trying to get information right, um, and you know, uh, very complicated and probably best not to go there because it will probably lead to me uh, going on a rant for a long while. But this should be, I think, in some regards, much simpler. Um, and you know, I think it, I, I kind of remember the exact words. Uh, of the, the lady from Aberdeenshire last week. But I think maybe we should go back um, to councils and say, what kind of information is it that's lacking at that point where a decision uh, is taken to refuse? Um, and then, you know, when it comes in, it comes uh, to the appeal and, and the, the award is granted. So it, it would maybe be an idea for us to go back and explore exactly what kind of information it is that's been lacking in these cases, which may actually resolve problems quite quickly. There's a factor, um, and a couple of the reasons why it may tend to crop up is, firstly, in the case of a crisis grant, you may not have all the information readily available uh, at, at short notice to be able to make an application. But since the, the the nature of the need being exceptional and short term is that you need to get the application in. That, that tends to be the priority. And so it's sort of understandable that further information to support that application may become available later. Um, the other factor, especially in relation to older people, which we've found, is that there is sometimes a tendency for older people to, to treat a local authority as a single entity which shares information perfectly within it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if they have contact with one individual from the local authority, um, but then it's a, a, a separate department, it's a separate officer who deals with an application, they may believe that that information has been shared with the local authority and therefore them already. Um, so it comes as a surprise when that information is, is not able to be relied upon for the basis of making a decision. And it's only at the stage where a decision comes down and you have then go for a review process that, that because there is further information and support either sought or available, that that tendency can be explored and, and counteracted. A point, maybe one of the things that needs to be asked at the initial stages is, are you in contact with anybody else in the local authority at this moment about any particular issue? And that way you could iron out the kind of difficulties that Mr Young is describing. The questions that are asked at that stage are really important. You're asking people at the front line to have a particular skill set. With my ex-careers advisor hat on here, is that knowing what questions to ask and how to ask them is really important. The second point I want to make is that the intention of the funds to be holistic and to be better linked at local level. I think the links between the third sector and all the guises that Mark Ballard just described and local authority staff in some areas is better than others. I've seen examples where there's been joint training and or there's been joint sessions. People know what information has to be shared to make the system work perfectly well. I would like to see that happening across the board where, I mean, certainly in Renfrewshire, for example, last year I attended a session uh, on behalf of SEDO talking about welfare reform generally, but what happened was, well, the third sector and the council were talking about what's working well, 
what information is working well, how do we need to tweak the system. So was that information sharing to make the fund work much more effectively at first line? So there's, there's opportunities, I think, um, around things like joint training, information sharing. And I know certainly the government have brought third sector organisations in to practitioner networks to talk about how they make more effective decisions as well. So there is good practice out there around that. To, to get up against the, the clock here, but the, the discussions last week with the local authorities and subsequently uh, myself and Jamie Hepburn, who sit on the finance committee as well, also got involved in this uh, discussion at our other committee, was around the efficiency of the system and the amount of uh, cost in terms of administration. Now, have you given any consideration to whether you believe that the administration costs are, are a problem uh, in relation to delivery of the service? You know, the point being made that you have a £33 million fund, but the administration costs at the present time are around £5 million. Some people thought that, that was excessive and efficient. Has anyone taken a view on that? <laughs> um, and yet the local authorities were saying that they, they, they were looking for additional funding to, to cover administration costs. I think I would be slightly concerned. I mean, it's a lot of money. Was it one to, less than but one to five of the fund? It's a lot of money. I think the question is how that money is used. And if there are examples where we know already of inefficiencies in the system, so people haven't to reapply again for something that actually in the first place, if they'd said they'd been given what they wanted, then, you know, it would have saved a dual process there. Um, there are clearly lessons to be learned from the first well, year and a half, roughly, of the fund now that, that, it, that there's a risk that it becomes overly bureaucratic. Um, and we've seen some examples of that in case studies that have been given. So I think it's about how we use that administration money more effectively, um, making sure that we aren't creating processes that actually cost more in the long run and make it far more difficult for applicants to get through the system and put them off the system in the first place. Information sharing, as Derek Young has, has outlined. Um, and I guess the last point would be around the assumption, and that we put this in a response, that the third sector will pick up additional costs in terms of actually responding to this scheme. I think we mentioned that the fund, the social, the social fund, had been managed down prior to this. So suddenly, people are starting to get, as, as, as my colleagues have outlined, getting more involved in seeing people through the application process, advocacy, um, you know, online staff. You have to train a new system, but it's done in existing budgets. So again, there's a, there's a hidden cost to the third sector in all of this as well. Um, but I think, going back to the point about administration, is that we need to make sure we're learning lessons as early as we possibly can about how the fund is operating and iron out those, those nuances that suddenly create in a, a public body that suddenly it becomes more difficult to apply for it, more costly, and you're repeating applications, which seems to me to be you know, pretty daft. <laughs> So we heard earlier around the involvement of the SPSO as the second tier of appeal. Um, again, concerns were raised about the cost of the SPSO becoming involved in order to create that national uh, standard. Um, in your experience, as anyone's experience around the table, is the SPSO more efficient, more bureaucratic? Would they be adding to this level of bureaucracy or, or in terms of the time scales involved, would they extend the length of time that people would be appealing if it was done through the SPSO as opposed to it being done locally by the local authorities themselves? Mark, do you have a view on that? But in terms of that point, as I, as I indicated earlier, one of the virtues we saw of the SPSO was the opportunity for, for learning from individual local authorities to be disseminated more widely. Because one of the things that I was struck by in, uh, in advance of this meeting when I was looking at the, the pattern of um, the proportion of budget that had been spent in 2013-14 was that I think there were 10 local authorities that had spent less than 75% of their budget and there wasn't any clear pattern. There wasn't any clear link between the local authorities that appeared to have an issue spending that budget and I've not looked at the, f the finance and how that the five million pounds um, that you referred to convener breaks down but I wonder if again there's significant variation between local authorities in spending so I think the challenge remains how we can make sure that we have a national framework um, we have learning which is disseminated ad effectively so that local authorities can identify best practice so that they can bring down those costs and see if there is a variation in costs, how some local authorities 
are doing it more effectively and efficiently than others because this is still a new fund. It's still a new way of doing things. And so hopefully this will be a learning phase where we can identify if there are ways that individual local authorities can learn from, from others as to how to effectively constrain the, the kind of costs that, that you talked about. And that's where I think the SPSO potentially has a benefit as part of that learning structure, supporting local authorities to, to deliver within their own local constraints, their own local context, but adapt best practice where possible. <laughs> brings me neatly to my last question before we come to any final comments. Uh, it was your reference to this being a new fund. Um, SCVO have commented on that fact and suggested that there's a possibility that we, we, could, we could be going too hastily to legislation. Um, Lynn, do you want to expand on that a bit and, and talk about the, the idea of a review? Um, because you're the only organisation that raised that. Although it has been brought to me, yeah. uh, not in the, the written submissions uh, that we've had, but other, other organisations have mm -hmm. uh, raised questions about the, the, the efficacy of, of putting this into legislation. So do you want to... To give us your views yeah, on that. absolutely. I think um, when we did the submission, which was a couple of months ago now, so I think you know probably I don't say our view has changed, but I think probably I think given the announcements last week uh, around more changes, I think when we initially called for a delay, I think we felt that this is the first kind of major piece of welfare, not one of the welfare sort of funds or things that the Scottish government have operated. Um, initially, when you look at the the evaluation, when you look at the statistics, there are significant gaps there. So we don't know how well the fund, for example, around the recording of vulnerabilities, um, and I think other colleagues picked that up, is that there are gaps in how the fund is operating, who it's reaching, you know, is it working well enough? Um, it wasn't immediately clear to me what the rationale for the legislation was. You know, we've, agreed, we've got an agreement in place that the fund operates. However, I think in terms of the delay, if there's a concern that we need to protect those applicants and make sure the fund stays in place and is working effectively and the legislation isn't required to do, to, to do that, then we would support that. It's just a sense that maybe we're rushing into things and saying, well, you know, do we, is the, is the context in which the fund is operating going to change? Is it working well enough before we jump into legislation and put it in a final and a, a more permanent footing? Um, but having spoken to colleagues, we were speaking today before we came in, and, and certainly we, we wonder whether there's potentially um, a risk to the fund. Would, would the fund stay in place? Would local authorities want to change how the fund operates? So would legislation protect the fund for applicants? Um, so there's, there are a number of questions around really being clear about what the rationale for the legislation is and what we're trying to achieve here. The second point we made around if the, if the bill is going ahead as it is, um, the second thing we want to highlight is the potential of a review clause within the bill. And the number of reasons for that, I think, you know, are quite clear is that, you know, we need to make sure we're getting this right. Is the fund working? Is it achieving the fund, the, the purpose it was set out to achieve? Um, is the context in which the fund is operating going to change over the next couple of years? We're in the middle of potentially for the devolution of powers to Scotland. So would that change the context in which the fund is operating? Um, you know, would we have to look at what it's doing and why it's doing what it's doing? Um, and I think just having done some work with the Standards Committee, looking at how legislation operates in the Scottish Parliament, is we don't do that enough, is review how, how legislation is working. So for me, I think a standard review clause, whether it's one year, two years, for us to revisit and make sure the fund is doing what it's intending to do, that people are being supported, um, just make sure that the scrutiny is there. So, um, I mean, in terms of a delay in the bill, I think we're a bit more ambivalent about that. So if, it, if it's delayed, then fine. But actually, what's more important is that if the legislation goes through, that actually we're regularly reviewing and making sure, making sure that it's actually working in the ground for people it's intended to help. Uh, yes, one of the points that we made uh, in our submission, although we didn't um, reflect SEVO's uh, call for a specific review as such or delay, um, was that the form of the bill uh, is such that uh, a great deal of the detail of the scheme is, is left to regulations. Um, 
one of the things that we've also noted is that the changes to the regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure, which obviously limits the availability or, or slightly hinders the availability of par proper parliamentary scrutiny if those regulations are to be subsequently changed. So there's a clear role for this committee, if the uh, regulations are changed, to be able to try and address some of the points that Lynn Williams has made about you know, reflecting on further uh, practice and trying to incorporate that in the regulations. There's still a need for scrutiny, and, and that, that committee has, this committee has a role there. But the second point, and this was alluded to in, in the, the point that Lynn Williams has just made, is about not just the legislation being right, but about the long-term financial viability of the fund as well. In the first year of operation, 23 million or thereabouts was put in by the DWP and 10 million added by the Scottish Government. Uh, we have seen that the funding that's going to local authorities under the equivalent system in England and Wales, the DWP is considering withdrawing that. Um, that has developed since the point where we uh, put in our written submission it's because there was a judicial review in England which has now been settled. Um, but I, I think it, it would aid public understanding if there was an agreement or some sort of formal uh, understanding between the DWP and the Scottish Government about the continued contribution that the DWP will make to the funds available to fund the fund uh, in Scotland. Uh, or if the Scottish Government is assuming that it is going to fund the scheme to the level it is at now, whether the DWP's funding comes or not, again, I, I can't see any reason why the Scottish Government would not want to make that public, uh, just so that there is an understanding and a level of confidence that, despite going through this process of putting the legislation on, on the statute book and getting it right, actually there will continue to be a fund at a level that you know, at least addresses the current level of need that we can see. Although it strikes me if the Scottish Government was to say that it was going to maintain this fund regardless, that that would be a signal for the DWP to remove their funding. Um, but <coughs> these are things that we have to deal with in politics, but that's, that's the reality of it. Um, can I thank everyone for their contributions? If you have any uh, additional information or any observations that you want to make after uh, you leave today, please feel free to, to write back to us. Um, obviously, the more information we have, the better we can scrutinise this, this legislation. But I certainly found your contributions this morning really helpful and informative. So thanks very much. And I'll suspend the meeting uh, for a, a period of time until we get our next panel ready. OK, thank you.
second round table this morning, uh, in which we're joined by John Shaw, who's a welfare rights worker with Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, Beth Reid, the Policy Officer of Citizens Advice Scotland, Jules Oldham, National Policy and Practice Coordinator, Homeless, Actions, Homeless Action Scotland, Bill Scott, Director of Policy and Inclusion Scotland, Paul Matsuncini, Director of Operations East at SACRO, and Duncan Dunlop, Chief Executive of Who Cares Scotland. Now, I know you were all uh, sitting in the, the public gallery watching the first session, and some of you have been in these positions before, uh, where we've had these round table discussions. So I genuinely hope that you'll be able to uh, make contributions as and when you see fit, um, ask questions, raise observations, give us information, and we'll see where the, the discussion takes us. But in order to kick off, I hope John Shaw doesn't mind me coming to him first. Um, but over the, the, the two sessions we've had so far, the issue of grants versus loans has, has been a, a major issue. You made um, a contribution in the written submission on that. And I just wonder, John, if you could give us CPAG's views on the merits or demerits or otherwise, or how th this dynamic op should operate. Um, we, we've always been firmly in favour of a grant system. Uh, the issue with loans is simply that the repayment then causes further financial pressure on an ongoing basis to those on the lowest incomes. Um, and I think there is, there is a clarity issue which came up in the previous session this morning. Um, the clause that's in the bill could be aimed at recovering funds which have been fraudulently claimed, or it could be the possibility of local authorities moving to a loans-based system in the future. And... In the local authority evidence sessions, um, one of the authorities, um, very wisely, I think, highlighted the possibility of making arrangements with local credit unions. And to me, that's one of the examples where a holistic Scottish welfare fund service could provide a crisis grant and signpost the applicant to a credit union which could provide a sustainable form of credit. And that, that for us, is a much better way of operating the Scottish welfare fund than moving towards a loans-based system. Other comments on that point? Yeah, Jules. To um, put anybody off who's in crisis for, for that kind of fear of, of actually needing to pay something back. Um, and it might be a minority of people, but I think there will be quite a few people um, who, who have now felt that they, they can actually go for the grant um, now that it is a grant system, whereas in the loan kind of loans of the past, they, they, kind of, they had that fear of, does it just mean that actually my crisis is two, three months down the line? So. Kevin, <coughs> um, because we talked about the costs of, uh, of administrating the fund as is, um, and I asked last week about, um, and I can't even remember if it, if it was during the public session, but um, administering a loans fund um, councils previously have done so in other spheres. The costs of administration there are, are immense. Do you think that you know if, if there was a move uh, to a loans rather than a grant system that we would see even more money being swallowed up by administration rather than going to the folks who are actually in need? It happened. Um, what the DWP had with the crisis loan system was the ability to make deductions at source from benefit entitlement as a way of recovering it. And that's a situation that local authorities simply are not in at the moment, so there would need to be an administrative mechanism to, to be set up, and that would add to the, the costs of the scheme to recover that money from people. Well? Yeah, I, I did a quick back and in both calculation in my head when you were saying about the £5 million and, and worked out. It's about £160,000 per local authority. Uh, across 30, 32 authorities. That isn't a lot of money. Um, that maybe pays for half a dozen staff when you consider that they then have to have cover for holidays, sickness, you know, etc. But you still need to maintain the service five days a week. Um, you know, there's not a lot of leeway there for the smaller authorities in particular, because I'm guessing that a lot more money is spent in Glasgow uh, and, and Edinburgh and, and the other big authorities. Um, so, you know, I, I don't see the administrative costs as being particularly high and probably um, they're lower than, than the actual old DWP costs. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just a, a quick point on, on this convener, because we discussed last week, you know, um, the idea of 
loans being an addition to grants, etc. And we also, there was a couple of local authorities particularly keen on this clawback thing. And uh, I think we should make, make it very plain that these things are separate. The idea of looking at some kind of loan system separate completely from the bill we're talking about now is fine. Um, what we're talking about in the bill is um, about amounts to be repaid, and I'm struck by Citizens Advice's submission we made quite clearly. Um, if it, this is specifically dealing with fraud, then let's perhaps look at how that is said, and it doesn't muddy the waters in terms of moving to loans, which should be a separate discussion. It says quite clearly in the regulations that it's a grant-making scheme and, it, and also in the, the explanatory memorandum. It doesn't say it on the face of the bill, and I think that needs to be explicit on the face of the bill that it, this is a grant-making scheme that we're talking about. And just in support of the points that um, were made earlier, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I don't think the recovery rate of, of loans under the old system was particularly high. So I think you've got, also got to think about that and actually whether it's worthwhile trying to recover cover loans and what the, the value of that is. My colleagues want to take it. Well, Bill, yeah, sorry. On that point as well, that there is evidence that under the loan scheme before, people were actually taking out payday loans to yes. repay the money to the DWP, which put them in even worse debt, which would make them more reliant on yeah. benefits in the future. And again, it, it, just, it just rolls out what, what is a one off crisis sometimes into being a long term you know, obligation to, to pay back money that you've not got. And it, it just doesn't work. So the possibility of this um, tying into support. Um, now, if, if you're actually owing the person that's giving you support, you're, you're far less likely to turn up to, to those appointments to actually um, access that support. So the, the kind of the gain of that isn't, isn't great when you think that somebody could actually be losing out on a, a whole support package. The same question, I suppose, I asked the, the, uh, the last group, and I think most of the witnesses were, were here for that, uh, and it's related again to the issue of second-tier reviews. And I note again uh, of the uh, organisations who expressed an opinion uh, in relation to uh, whether or not the uh, Ombudsman should be the uh, body uh, that uh, conducts second-tier reviews. I think uh, all were uh, in favour and again, that contrasted little with what we were hearing from local authorities last week. So I wonder if, if people could comment on why they think the Ombudsman is the, the appropriate body. I think, the, I think the arguments were set out quite clearly in, in the last session from our, our point of view, having um, a, a source of review which is independent of, of, of local authorities, both to, um, to ensure that it is independent, but also that, um, that it's seen to be independent. And we, we would be concerned about some clients who, who may just be put off from, from making that review process if, if they thought that was appropriate because they felt it, it was going back to the local authority again and they didn't feel confident in that process. Um, the points about monitoring, I think, are, are really important to have that national consistency and also to have a, some sort of reporting mechanism on that. Um, one thing that we've been uh, thinking quite a lot about is, is what that actually looks like. And at the moment, there isn't any provision in the bill to make the second tier review statutory process. And I understand that's um, to do with how the Ombudsman is, is governed and so on. But I think we do need to look at how we make sure that the, the process for se second tier review is um, clearly defined with rules and, and timescales and that kind of thing, whether that's through this bill or through that, through um, uh, further legislation relating to the Ombudsman's own legislation itself. I, I do think that needs to be addressed somehow. Um, yeah, I'd like to just add a couple of things to that. It's a, a small point on the independence um, in the local authority session. Um, one of the welfare fund managers you, you had giving evidence said that she would be in the room with the panel to assist them. And in, I'm not suggesting that that's actually causing it to be less independent, but in terms of a, somebody's perception of independence, that somebody from the decision-making team is there, but there is no access for the applicant to that panel. Um, that's a real issue. Um, and I think in terms of quality improvements, that was a, a big question mark for us because one of the reasons the independent review service was so respected in the sector was that they looked at the decisions they were making, they had identified themes and they issued directions which bound everybody. 
And the issue with a binding decision on one local authority is about how the other 31 local authorities become aware of the terms of that decision to ensure the national consistency of the fund. So I think that is the unanswered question really about the review mechanism in terms of how we ensure the quality improvement of the, the scheme. We, we asked disabled people who had experience of making applications you know, what, what scheme they would prefer. And uh, it, it wasn't overwhelmingly f uh, for um, the uh, ombudsman. It was just marginally a majority in favour of that. And the second one was independent tribunal. Um, and, but nobody, but nobody said it should be the local authority. Not one single disabled person that we asked said it should be the local authority because they said that it would not be perceived to be fair um, even, if it w even if the decision was the correct one, it wouldn't be perceived to be fair because they were reviewing their own decisions and, and it just was felt to be unfair. So that's asking the people who have actually gone through the process what, what they would like and, and they came down marginally in favour of the Ombudsman. But, you know, tribunal service, unfortunately, I think would be very expensive and slower. And I, 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 think, I, I think best right, you know, we need to see some clear guidance on time scales for making the reviews, et cetera, so that people have you know, expectations that can be met and, and, and left living in crisis for, for, for months. <laughs> From your point of view, but maybe also Paolo, in terms of the, the importance of independence um, on, on the appeals process. Um, I'll, I'll come to Duncan first and then to you, Paolo. Mm -hmm. Well, we have this because we're an independent advocacy provision service for uh, care experience, young people. And we have this in parallel conversation quite a lot going on with uh, local authorities because a lot of them believe that children's rights services they provide uh, within their own local authorities are able to provide advocacy services which are independent from their authority. But the perception, and it comes down to the individuals and the management frameworks within which that's governed, so it's down to individuals. It's not a foolproof by any manner of means. Uh, but the young people who are accessing that service are far more are less likely to use that or want to use that service because it's not independent in terms of looking at the children's rights basis. And so therefore, when you look at an ombudsman situation, they're less likely to even bother asking it to be reviewed because they believe that it's part of the same system and therefore the same management and hierarchy, the same establishment that's rejected the first claim. So why would they go through it again? Uh, and in terms of people who are obviously in a great deal of vulnerability emotionally at that time, it would uh, be great if they could actually think that this is actually being viewed independently. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would echo a lot of the comments that have already been made. The uh, appearance or perception of independence and transparency uh, is really important. SACRO works with um, people who could, broadly speaking, be described as being in the justice sector. We haven't made a specific uh, submission to committee uh, on the welfare uh, reform proposal, but uh, most of the individuals that we work with will be affected by, uh, by the proposal in some way, shape or form. Um, I think in terms of the SPSO part of second tier uh, tribu tribunals, I think the SPSO acknowledges that there would be some challenges for it, both in terms of the low number of referrals that might be coming in, as well as those at the higher end, uh, and developing the expertise, but certainly from the feedback we get from our service users and the people we provide services to, um, the idea of uh, having an independent body or independent person looking at uh, the decision that's originally been made would be a valuable one. Anyone else? Alex? What's going to I'm going to play devil's advocate and go back to a comment that was actually made by the convener in the last panel. And that is that when we look at these appeals procedures, uh, invariably what we find is that they're very successful. And the reason why they're very successful is that they do all the things that probably weren't done properly in the initial application. So the quality of the application uh, may be upgraded, the, uh, the evidence that's required may pe be provided. And I just wonder if we're not taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut by going from the initial rejection to a high-level appeals process without having something in between which gives the opportunity for that correction 
and review to take place, which seems to be what quite often the appeals procedure is actually delivering? That, that's the first tier review that's carried out by the local authority itself. And, and, and I would agree that that, that, that 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 is the best and most efficient way to carry out a first tier review is for somebody you know, else to look at the decision and say, was discretion properly applied and you know, was, was, have we got all the evidence that we actually need to, to have come to a determination on this? Because I think, as you, as you said, you know, earlier evidence, uh, a lot of the ATOS decisions um, they're not decisions at the end of the day, it's the DWP that makes the decision, but the recommendation to the DWP from ATOS, 40% uh, of, the, uh, of their recommendations in the assessments were found by the DWP to be based on inadequate information, which means that they shouldn't have been made in the first place. The, you know, if there's a need for extra information, it should be gathered uh, before a decision is made as, as far as you're able. Uh, and if not, at the first tier review stage would be the best place to, to gather that additional information, if that's all that's really needed. It's where there's, I, I perceive, feeling any injustice about the decision that somebody's good, probably going to take it to a second tier review. Slightly from that, would anybody be willing to speculate as to how efficient the process proposed would be and how many or what proportion of cases might emerge uh, at the top of this process, uh, because that makes a big difference in this. You know, if it's uh, you know if it's ten percent uh, that makes it to the top, then that might be acceptable. Well, if it's fifty percent that get through to the top, then it becomes a, an administrative and a, a financial burden. I think at the moment um, the number of cases going going through through the review process is actually fairly low. So, um, you know, if that that con continues, then. It, it, it may not be a huge number, but I think the point that was made in the last session about the questions that are asked right at the beginning is really crucial, and I think it also uh, links into um, some concerns that we've had about a few cases where there might be gatekeeping going on, and, and this may be particularly... I, I don't have evidence to, to, to back this, but um, I think particularly where f applications are made over the phone and where somebody speaks to a decision-maker, I think that is... Uh, it has a lot of benefits to, to, to be able to speak directly to a decision maker during that application process. But I think there may be uh, times when the right questions aren't asked at that stage or where things are said to um, applicants which kind of discourage them. Oh, we're only make, taking high priority applications at the moment. Oh, we, we had a case like yours the other day, but they didn't, they didn't you know, go the full way. And then people don't disclose the full information. And... and you know, that may not be then um, taken forward as, as an application. And then somebody, we, we've had cases where people think they've made an application and, and, and realise they haven't. It's only when they get to a re review stage that they find out that actually it wasn't taken forward as an application. So I think, you know, there's things, things like that that we need to make sure that we're that all correct information is gathered as early on as possible within the limits of the timescales to make sure that, that, you know, any crisis that somebody's facing is, is met um, as, as quickly as it, as it needs to be. on that point because I, I jotted these things down. Thank you, Beth. But I, I can't remember who said what, but in this um, written evidence submission from various people, there's two things that are mentioned. One is the suggestion of um, somehow having a definition of application. And the other one was um, should, in fact, there be a, a legislative duty to accept and record all applications which might take away from that pre-application discouragement. And I just wondered if we could explore that a wee bit further, please, convener. Colleagues, have any comments on John? If anybody can remember who said it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the second point was us. Um, <laughs> and, and we do still have... Um, you know, we are still seeing cases coming up. And one of the things we'll see is, because we provide second-tier advice, we'll be given case studies by advisors of them arguing the decision-maker into accepting an application in order to reject it. And then you wonder about what happens with an unsupported applicant, whether they're put off. And, and I think at times the discussion with local authorities seemed almost to be missing the point a wee bit because one of the comments was that once an application is recorded on our Northgate system, it's passed straight to the decision-maker. But the, the point about gatekeeping is that you're not getting to the point of having an application registered, so you don't have the right to request a review. Um, so I do think that's, that's still a live issue, and it is 
something which is getting better, but we're seeing it in different ways as well now. Um, there's a very recent case study to our advice, though, where somebody was awarded a crisis grant because they were in that so common situation of challenging an ESA decision, no benefit in payment, but told that they could not be awarded a repeat application for a crisis grant until they had a qualifying benefit in payment. And you can read the guidance end to end and you will not see that information. So it was awarding it, but gatekeeping a future application, if you like. So putting somebody off from coming back if the crisis wasn't resolved. Yeah. Uh, on that point, convener, I, I wonder if anyone has any examples of local authorities where there are specific problems in this particular area. Because I think what would be interesting for us, convener, is we've heard from the local authorities um, that they have a combination of staffing uh, now doing this work. In some cases, it's revenue and benefits officers. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, welfare rights officers. In some cases, it's a, a combination uh, of those and some others. Now, it would be really interesting to see if the best practice is coming from areas where um, there are specific team makeup, if you like, because some of these folks will have been more used to applications than, than others. And I wonder if maybe, um, you know, if there is any examples that folk have got of where it is working particularly well where it is not, and if we could find out what combination of folks they've moved in, because there may actually be a best practice already out there. Ken, do you want to bring in some questions? Uh, yes, if I may. Just, just to continue uh, an issue that we've raised in the previous session, uh, which is about this idea of offering cash versus in-kind um, benefits, and a number of, of organisations around the table commented on this, I think uh, Housing Action Scotland won. Um, uh, we don't seem to be using this bill as an opportunity to end this form of stigmatising. Do, do, do you have a, a worry about that? Perhaps Jules to come in first. Yeah, um, it, it just doesn't seem to, um, to, to answer all the questions if, if, you're, if you're giving somebody a voucher. And we're, we're kind of treating people like they're unable to, to make their choices with a voucher. Um, there was some work done by, I think, Phil Brown and Salford University recently on individual budget systems. Now, people at the, the real end of, of kind of complex needs, they were offered, I think it was two, three thousand pounds each to help help themselves out of whatever point they were at. And the average spend was about 400 pounds per person. People are really savvy with money. And, and I don't think that's what a voucher kind of enables people to do. Um, with a voucher, you're, you're kind of almost forced to make best of that voucher, you know, to, to try and spend every penny of it. At that given time as well, you don't, get, you don't get money back for the voucher to kind of go, well, I can't carry everything today, so I'll come back in tomorrow. Or maybe I'm not sure that uh, this actually comes to the total amount of spend, so I'll come back tomorrow or, you know, avoid that embarrassment. So we just seem to be kind of moving away from the, the trust element and, and giving somebody a whole host of problems, which, as we can see from the figures, not everybody's actually then choosing to use the vouchers, probably as a result of that, yes, stigmatisation, but also just it doesn't work for them. Or they've not got the money to get to the place that the voucher needs to be spent. And I could go on about this for hours if you want me to. <laughs> the, the some of the local authorities were saying that, um, uh, as, as evidence to support their decisions not to use to use vouchers rather than cash, they were saying that uh, um, uh, people, if you offer bus tickets, they don't get used, which is evidence that they, I wasn't quite sure that meant that, that they declined the offer of the award, therefore they didn't want it in the first place. If they had were offered uh, goods in kind, they sometimes sold them on. There are a number of repeat users. Was evidence that actually. You know, they weren't using the money effectively. I have to say, I, I was a bit taken by that evidence because um, I'm not sure that's evidence that we shouldn't be trying to develop trust. You know, maybe we should be helping, offering more help to those particular individuals. It didn't strike me. Well, what perhaps what struck me is that if we're basing the entire system on those few individuals, then perhaps we're getting things the wrong way around. Absolutely. When when we're basing things on such a small minority, can we look at that minority and say? okay, you're likely to have an addiction were you to be in that minority. 
what are you going to do with that voucher? Your, or your, the goods? OK, you're going to sell it on. It's not that the voucher's not going to stop you getting a hit. You might just get less of a hit and need to go shoplifting as well. Um, or your, your child was maybe managing to get some of the money and the hit been taken, but in this case, actually, maybe the child doesn't benefit. You know, it, it's kind of, it's not that you're taking that minority out of the equation and solving everything. Um, it's just that the, you're almost making a black market of, of vouchers, um, which seems to, to really um, go against so many people that would benefit from, from cash that they could use so wisely. Um, so, yeah, it, it doesn't really weigh up. Yes, I was just going to echo uh, what Jules was saying there. Uh, many of the individuals that we work with are coming out of custody and the idea of applying for a loan, uh, anecdotally, the feedback we have is that they would, not, they would not apply. It's likely to dissuade them from applying. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the needs um, that could be met, but that they would not, uh, generally speaking, apply for a loan. Um, I think the issue around how money is spent uh, is, uh, and the concern that it might be misspent, uh, a grant might be misspent, uh, is a reasonable uh, point to make. Certainly some of the individuals have addiction problems, haven't budgeted properly, um, and need assistance with that, that kind of activity, learning to manage their money properly. Um, and that's part of the work that uh, our staff do with them. So I think in, in summary, I, I think cash uh, or goods might be preferable to certainly loans. I think, you know, if, if there's going to be goods provision, it has to be about choice. And coming back to the local authority session, there was a, a sort of suggestion that one authority was offering visits to someone's home from energy advisors to people who needed support with fuel costs. And, and that's quite invasive. And if that's a condition of accepting your energy voucher, that's, that's not to say that somebody's not got no money to put in the electricity meter. It's, it just didn't seem to be making the point. And it's... I think, again, with supermarket vouchers, there's, there's some real concern there in terms of, as Jules said, you know, whether you can actually get to the supermarket to spend it. Um, if it's restricted in terms of the goods that people can buy to, you know, that stereotypical idea that people are just going to go and buy some booze and bags with it, then that's going to cost local authorities and it's going to have an administrative cost for them. And we also have been getting kind of worrying examples of people who are on the phone taking applications saying, our authority does food and clothing vouchers. What you are asking for is not that. And it, it's potentially an issue about whether this person was clear that you could also apply for a community care grant and a crisis grant in the same call. But the idea that, you know, your need does not fit within these boxes and it's led by what we've got a book of vouchers for sitting in our office as to, to what the, the fund can help with, which is really concerning, I think. Yeah. Well. I, when we asked disabled people about this, they were actually quite divided on it. There were a number of them could actually understand that bulk purchasing might make the fund go, go further mm -hmm. and, and therefore more people would be helped, etc. Um, but there were also, there was, a, there was a huge concern around stigma, uh, stigmatisation, especially a voucher scheme. Um, one woman, and this is, this is a, a real story, one woman was given a voucher, sent along to a department store in a small uh, you know, town in the Highlands um, where uh, she went up to the, the uh, cash desk and handed across the voucher and said, I'm here to make, you know, to get something with this. And um, the woman taking the voucher used the tannoy to say, uh, could a supervisor or manager please come to this till we've got one of those welfare claimants in again, right? Mm -hmm. To the whole store across the tannoy, you know? And you, you can understand how that woman felt, had mental health problems already. Now everybody knows her business, everybody knows um, what she was there for, etc. So, you know, um, although there, there was a division of opinion, most people actually didn't like the idea of vouchers, particularly because of the stigma. Store cards might be slightly better, but I, I understand all the problems going back to being in the Highlands or rural parts of Scotland. How do you get to the place where you can actually use the, the card? I, I mean, I, I actually think 
you know, if, if, you, if you can use it in a city, etc., um, and it's not a huge distance between the, the stores and you can get more for it, great. But um, again, the lack of choice for disabled people was, was a really big issue. Um, uh, again, we had examples of people being told, you can get this bed because that's the beds we bulk purchased, but you can't get a bed that meets your needs because you, you, you've got a, a back that needs a special mattress, etc. And, and that's just a waste of money if you're supplying something that doesn't meet the person's needs because they're going to have to get something else in the future, probably through the social work department, getting an adapted bed, etc. Whereas if it could be done you know, with that grant when, when they first move into the house, then, then it's done uh, because you can wait months for an, a, a, an adaptation, unfortunately. Um, same with a cooker where somebody of short stature um, you know, could not use the cookers that had been pur purchased because they needed a low-level one. So it, there has to be built in the option of choice um, if, if goods are going to be provided and say, yeah, we understand you know, you're going to use bulk purchasing, but it must meet the needs of the individual that's making the application. Saying there, really, that um, it really has to be appropriate to the needs of... of um, the individual, and I, I think you know that that operates at, at, at two different stages. Really, there's, um, I mean, we have come across one or two stories where people are being offered vouchers, but the only way they can receive the vouchers, let alone go and spend it, is either by email or by post. Now, if you don't have an email address, that's very difficult. And if you're in crisis, you can't wait two or three days for the post to arrive. Um, so, you know, there's that stage, and then you know, we, we've also got stories about people who've been um, supplied with with completely inappropriate goods for their needs, and and actually, just as Bill says, you know, that's that's a value for money issue. If you're going to have to then re go back to that place, pick up the furniture, go and deliver something else, you know, that's that that's just wasting wasting time and resources. To say that it's not that we're we're against the kind of furniture package side of things as well. It really is it's the actual vouchers. But the furniture package side of things, um, I mean, actually going back six or seven years, Scott Robertson from Quarriers that was here earlier, him and I sat and, and looked at their drum chapel model that was allowing furniture pa packages to go to for young people moving into the, to their tenancies. And we said, wouldn't that be wonderful if everybody had that as an option? But it's the option and the choice and for, for the backup plan not to fall into to kind of vouchers. But I just want to make it clear that Homeless Action Scotland is not saying no to furniture packages. We're saying no to, to vouchers. Well, that, that, just uh, picking up, because that was kind of the point I was going to try to get to the bottom of, um, leaving to one side the issue of vouchers and the stigma and all the other very good points that have been raised in connection with vouchers. Uh, going back to furniture and anything else that a council or local authority can do, not necessarily as a purchase in terms of an economy of scale, going to Bill's point about meeting the individual needs, but rather the local authority is a perhaps more powerful purchaser in the sense that they may be able to secure a better deal. Uh, and therefore, going back to the point that that allows more money to stay in the fund to, to help more people, uh, is that really then Jill's point, the last point that she made there, is that what you would all kind of agree on, that furniture packaging, if it meets people's needs, of course, is um, a reasonable proposition, but vouchers might be, uh, for some people, a step too far. Is that, am I picking this up correctly? Yeah, I think it's about where it's someone's choice and where it better meets needs. And I think it's important to recognise there are good practice examples out there. I'm, I think I was talking to the head of Scottish Welfare Fund at North Lanarkshire, but don't quote me if that's not correct. And he was talking about how they do have standard goods, but where somebody expresses a need for adapted goods, they will go through their own occupational therapy department and the budget from the welfare fund will be used to pay for something sourced through occupational therapy which meets that person's need. So that is an example of good practice. But the key thing is that that authority has decided to, to go beyond, you know, what would really be on the face of this bill because what's on the bill at the moment is you choose whether it's cash or kind and there's nothing to suggest that it has to meet needs on the face of the bill. So, you know, to make the good practice the consistent practice across Scotland, I think that's what's needed, that before an authority can award anything in kind, whether it be store card vouchers or items, they have to consciously consider whether that's what the person needs. Linda, you wanted to make a point? 
just to reinforce some of what's already been said, which was about the, the point about, uh, came up in the last session, about local authorities, um, even within the one local authority, having dialogue and working together. And the, the example that John just mentioned, which may have been North Lanarkshire, <laughs> um, is, is one of where discretion can be used wisely. But certainly from, from some experience I've had in related issues, the theory might be there, but the practice is often very, very different. And uh, the length of time it can take for um, separate departments to actually get together and come to a decision, let alone separate providers such as perhaps the health service and the local authority working together can take even longer. And in the context of, of the kind of grants we are talking about, that's very problematic. So it is about um, good practice modelling and, and local authorities learning as well uh, how that should be better done. Uh, yes, it's just to expand, because I think the, the difficulty is that I'm not sure that the, the, the correct principles are therefore at the heart of the bill here. That's what worries me. Uh, I heard, heard Jimmy Wales, uh, the founder of Wikipedia on the radio yesterday, he was saying that um, uh, his assumption was that we should... We should, we should make our assumptions based on the fact that most people are good and decent, you know. Of every 1,000 people, 990 are actually good. And that should be the founding principle here. And yet, uh, I think as John Shodges pointed out, there's all sorts of uh, judgmental decisions being made here in, in meeting people's needs. Uh, and I think, I think Duncan, um, I think you gave an example that at the moment, uh, I think you gave an example that uh, one of the young people had left care, their, their social media activities were scrutinised, is that right? And, and actually their, their application was declined because of that, is that right? Yeah. No, th th uh, we spoke to a number of young people who always do this and they're more than happy to get them in front of this committee. They're very keen to do that. That's a side issue. I was, I was listening to that conversation around vouchers and goods and all the rest and, uh, and all the, uh, what happens here. And I think there's, a, there's an issue about care experienced young people because I was looking at the the evidence in terms of the vulnerabilities of people who've made applications to this fund in the last financial year. And it said 1% were actually care leavers. But it also said that 26% were homeless, 9% were offenders, 54% had mental health problems, and 14% had addictions. But then I know that um, if you look at uh, your homeless population, 20 to 30% of them are care leavers. If you look at your young, your young offenders in Pullman any one time, up to 80% of that population are care leavers. Uh, and we know that more than half the young people that are leaving care at 16 will have a significant mental health problem. So the fact we've only been able to identify that 1% of those above were actually care leavers means we did not identify the care leavers and the care experienced people, which is a significant issue because they are different, uh, although they may well have a lot of those uh, issues that they're trying to contend with, those behavior traits to a degree are a consequence in large of being part of the care system. And it is good, it was mentioned earlier, Kevin was talking about the care experience people in terms of, and this parliament has looked to do quite a lot with through the Education and Culture Committee and the Children and Young People's Act that's been passed, is that this type of initiative and scrutinising looking where, how is this impacting care experience people? And to make sure, firstly, that it is, um, and this bill, marries up with the guidance that's currently being written in parts 9, 10 and 11, which is around corporate parenting duties, which is on uh, continuing care and aftercare, which means young people can now stay in care up to 21 and get significant support till 26. There's no point in having a parallel system for those young people who may well have severe needs when they're leaving care and have a, a bunch of issues in terms of what care represented and meant to them. Uh, and at the same time, with the support that will come in through the, the great moves in legislation that we achieved at the beginning of this year through continuing care and aftercare and having a welfare uh, reform, uh, Scottish Welfare Fund, that doesn't marry up with that. And what I was hearing in this in terms of is care experienced people, there's two requirements we need to recognise in basic terms. They need or will lack a stable, loving, uh, constructive relationship that can help them guide their way through life. So if you were to give them a grant, whether it's a crisis grant or a community grant to set up a flat, how has this been related to their care identity uh, in terms of have they had one of these already and why did that flat break down? Why did that you know, accommodation break down? And what support is being given to them? 
because the people who are administering this local authorities are their corporate parent, and that's come in. So what is that corporate parent doing when they get the phone call for the crisis grant? Isn't to reject the application. So as I think Mark Ballard said from Bernardo's, we should, this should be a red flag to us in terms of saying, right, okay, let's look at giving you the support because you're not going to be able to go to your mom's house to get your dinner tonight or be able to get your washing done or maybe sleep there. Red flag, let's get the support. But then who in the other side of this, in the, someone mentioned the local authorities communicating with each other, where are we making sure that you're getting some support, that you have this relationship that's going to hold you? Otherwise, you're in an extremely vulnerable position. Um, and it, it was the case with a young lad who talked about the fact that he went through this process uh, and the, in general had lo low self-esteem. And then he found out that when they rang him back after doing a bit of an investigation, they'd been on his Facebook page, which hadn't been updated, and, and uh, it said no, that uh, he was rejected on account of historical information that hadn't been updated in his Facebook page. And that's what was seen as, uh, as, as, as grounds for um, rejecting his application. So our general appeal is that we need to again see this not just as 1% and an issue, but the significant headache for us because of corporate parents. We know that this population, there are only 1.5% of our whole population, are significantly overrepresented in all of these issues and in using this fund. But it's a real demonstration of what we're getting wrong in Scotland that we can't even identify them. And they feel so stigmatized that they won't say they're care experienced when they're on the phone call to the advisor because they believe that is going to be, as it's always felt to them, uh, going to be um, not beneficial for their application. Sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, I've gone off on one. More than answers it. Thank you. <laughs> may, may I move on to another topic? Yeah. Just I have to see that everybody's spoken very forcefully at that point, and I'm thankful for that. Second point was about uh, about outsourcing, which again, a number of uh, uh, a number of you commented on. I think uh, just John, you to start with um, whether or not. Um, this idea of privatising these services should be desirable. We're quite clearly against it. We think uh, the welfare fund should be a matter for government provision, not private sector. Um, and if there is the decision <coughs> taken to, to take that forward as a clause in the bill, then it really has to have some kind of safeguarding. Um, it's, it's almost like another area where you can't quite tell what the bill's getting at, because it, it feels like it could be aimed potentially at the smaller local authorities establishing a joint welfare fund. I mean, it's, that's explicitly permitted, but um, I think there's a, a world of difference between Clax and Falkirk going in together as two smaller local authorities and having private sector contractors delivering the welfare fund and profiting from it. Um, and there's in the local authority session, something else I, I noticed was this kind of idea that um, one of the people giving evidence was talking about the third sector and specifically mentioning citizens' advice. And as a former citizens' advice advisor, there's a real issue there because, you know, if you're advocating for somebody and supporting them to make an application, you lose your ability to do that on any level if you're also involved in deciding that application. And that is a real issue, you know, in terms of just the idea that, coming back to what Lynn said in the first session, the third sector might be expected to pick things up. So I think there's a number of issues with it, and, and we think just generally it should be a matter for government to deliver this because it is such a vital service. Just on about citizens' advice, I think we would be very, very, very nervous about anything like that. Um, in terms of the kind of wider points, what it seems to say in the bill is, is talking about administering the welfare fund, and it's not clear whether that's about administering the delivery of goods and that kind of thing, or it's actually administering the kind of the, the, the application process and that kind of thing, which I think um, you know need, needs to be much clearer. Uh, I think one of our other concerns about um, outsourcing is. Um, accountability and transparency and how you make sure that it works for, for the applicants and that you know, it's all too often you get this this situation where people just bounce between well you know that that's not our local authority saying that's not our responsibility it's the contractors and the contractors saying well we well we've not had the email from them you know and all those kind of things so you need to have a very very clear um, system of, of transparency if, if that is something that you're going to consider come back tiny point on that as well the bill has drafted if it was outsourced it doesn't appear that there's um, any ability to review decisions if a, a fund was outsourced to a third party rather than a local authority so you know, lots of issues well just, just to be 
course, what, what John said, I'm, I'm an ex-welfare rights uh, worker as well, and it would have destroyed our credibility in the local community if we were making decisions on whether people got um, social fund loans or grants, because you know, nobody would have come to us thereafter with problems in other areas, because they would have seen us as part of the problem rather than part of the solution. You can't be a determined advocate on somebody's behalf and then switch off and become this objective, discretionary decision maker. It just, it just wouldn't work. And I, I, I'm also worried about you know, the idea that the third sector might be able to bid for contracts, but the private sector wouldn't. Since when's that? It's European law. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, as soon as you open the door to the third sector bidding to, to do this for a local authority, you're opening the door for the private sector as well. And all the disabled people's experience of the private sector um, in terms of ATOS, capita, etc., the de delivery of the PIP assessments is an absolute disaster area. And it's partially because of the public sector's inability to draw up you know, contracts that actually are meaningful uh, because you know, the estimate was that each assessment would take 40 minutes and that 75% of them would be take, you know, this is the PIP assessments, would take place face to face. In practice, 95% are face to face and they take an average of two hours. Now, that, that's, that's bad drafting on the public sector's point, point of view and, and it's poor provision on the private sector because they end up with a mess they're trying to sort that out. So, you know, as I say, our experience has been, been an absolute disaster and we don't want to see it privatised in any way, shape or form. We would also um, be thinking that uh, the, on the terms of signposting, were you to have, um, say, three local authorities that, that chose to, to opt out and, and take it uh, another route, then wh what do you do as, as signposting to somebody? Oh, well, actually... Um, Everybody else is doing it through their local authority, but well, let me just check. No, not yours. Um, that, that really makes it quite difficult to, to just do nice, clear signposting. It also doesn't send out, send out the best of messages to somebody saying, oh, because well, your local authority didn't have the wherewithal to actually go ahead and, and do it, but the other, however many have done it. So on a message front on and on consistency, not brilliant, but actually signposting and getting somebody the advice quickly, I think that will add an, an extra layer of difficulty within that. Yeah. Um, observation I think we would make is that giving local authorities the power to jointly administer the funds may actually be a, a useful bit of flexibility. Um, as long as the proper arrangements were made to scope out need, scope out um, where that need uh, is, is greatest and target those uh, resources accordingly might be very, uh, might work actually quite well. Um, I think it touches on the point that uh, Mrs Ewing made about the uh, greater purchasing power that local authorities might have if they combine that together, notwithstanding some of the earlier uh, contributions that were made around um, goods v, uh, v vouchers and, and how people might respond to that. But I think the bigger issue is around uh, local authorities administrating, uh, administratively uh, managing it, is that it chimes with a lot of the work that they already do in terms of the policy imperatives of, of the bill, providing a safety net and, uh, and helping uh, individuals remain in their communities. Local authorities already appear to be doing a lot of that work anyway. Um, so there is a, um, a nice synergy there, and possibly some of that might be lost or interrupted if it were a, a private or third-party agency that, that was providing the service. Yes, I don't want to take a question. Nothing to separate. Yes, I, you know, um, I had a question. It, it was picking up on a point made in the first session. Um, I think it was the representative from Age Scotland about the overall resources for the, the Welfare Fund and uh, looking at um, the submission from Inclusion Scotland. Uh, the point is made, uh, and I quote, unless the Scottish Government acquired new revenue sources and or powers over benefit conditions, it is difficult to envisage how this increase in calling resources to meet short-term need can ever be, quotations, fully addressed. That was in response to a question, I think, from the, the, the committee in terms of people's submissions and I just wonder if uh, Bill could expand on that um, because that 
you know, all the points we've been discussing are very important points in terms of detail, but also an, an equally important point is the context within which this all sits, which is a, a resource issue as well. Something we would, we would definitely support SCVO in terms of looking for a review of how the welfare funds operate and in the context of you know, the background changes. Um, benefit sanction regime, and the Welfare Reform Committee will be very familiar with this, has got a lot more punitive uh, in the last 18 months um, than it was before. The number of sanctions has increased dramatically. Uh, the length of the sanctions has increased dramatically. And people can now be sanctioned for up to three years. Now, that means um, you know, that there are going to be people in the system who are in constant need. And, and this fund isn't established for people that are in constant need. It, it will make three payments a year, maximum. And there are people who are living on far, far less than what the government defines the poverty line, now expected to live on it for, for at least three months, a year, three years, you know, increasingly. Um, we'll see that occurring. Um, and, and a lot of the people that are being sanctioned are young people, leaving care, etc., uh, disabled people, uh, etc. Those least able to negotiate the rest of the system and, and more likely to be reliant on a local authority for help, etc. So that's why we say we, we don't think the need can be met. And it's another reason why we would like to see every application recorded, um, because we need to measure the unmet need. We need to find out what the fund isn't able to resource, as well as what the fund has been able to resource. Because you know, some local authorities are, are spending up to and, and, and just over what they're getting as, as their budget. Um, other authorities aren't, and, and I'd like to know why. Because, because we know that the need exists. So you know, we, would, we would like to find out more about who isn't having their needs met and why, um, you know, because of repeat applications, etc. Um, to find out, you know, how, how we respond as a society uh, in Scotland to, to that increasing level we need. Following on from that to a degree, you know, one, one area of massive concern for us is the issue of families under exceptional pressure, which was more than half of the community care grant budget. I know the figures are not directly comparable, but the fact that you know, only 20% of community care grant applicants are, are under that heading, and that tends to be the people who are, from anecdotal personal experience, most reluctant to deal with the local authority, terrified that any sort of suggestion they're struggling to pay the bills is going to mean that there'll be social work involvement. I don't see that as a correct perception at all. It's just the way that people see the system. And it feeds into the kind of what's on the face of the bill in terms of defining the parameters of the scheme. So an example from the guidance is that um, there's no specific ability to award community care grants for travel costs. And we've got case studies of people who have travel costs to go and visit relatives in hospital who are told that these are not eligible because they don't fit within maintaining a settled way of life as it's seen by that decision maker. So I think there's, a, there's an important point there in terms of making sure that the needs are met by the groups that the guidance quite clearly intends to meet the needs of. And if we're um, on the face of the bill at the moment, it's families facing exceptional pressure is taking a back seat and the statistics appear to be showing that families with children are applying less than they were for community care grants under the old system. <clears throat> it occurred to me that it's an issue that I don't think we've addressed in either session uh, uh, which has relevance uh, to a point, and that is the issue of the DWP hardship payments or whatever the current terminology is. And I just wonder what's the, the experience of, of you guys in the front line? Is that happening? Is it happening the way it should? Is there signposting? <clears throat> what's the current state of play? Because it's a relevant issue as we look at the, the needs of people who are in extremis. I was lucky enough to hear David Webster speak last week, uh, and again, he may be familiar to the committee. Um, and, and again, on his, you know, looking at the figures and uh, freedom of information requests for the DWP, he thinks that only about 25% of those who are currently sanctioned are receiving the hardship payment. 
um, which means 75 per cent aren't. So they, they're living on, on very, very little, um, or if, if anything at all. Um, so, you know, th th there is definitely an issue there. Um, and, you know, people say people aren't starving to death in this country, but, you know, one disabled person has starved to death. An ex-serviceman has died because, you know, he couldn't keep his insulin cold enough, uh, et cetera, because he couldn't afford heat, uh, you know, energy for his, for his fridge. Um, these things are happening, and uh, you know, the hardship payments are, are quite you know, strictly defined who, who will receive them, and, and not everybody will qualify for a hardship payment. And, and one of the questions we asked Bureau advisors was about hardship payments and whether people are, are aware of them when they come to Bureau. Uh, I can't remember what the statistics are off the top of my head, but certainly uh, the, the majority felt that people were not aware of, of hardship payments and weren't being aware of, of that process and the appeals process when, when they were at the job centre. Um, I think it's worth remembering that um, unless you are categorised as a vulnerable person, you can't get a hardship payment for the first 14, weeks of a, 14 days of a sanction anyway. So you're always going to have that two-week gap. The Oakley report is, uh, is due to improve communications around hardship, and we hope that that will work. Um, we will be monitoring that, but um, you know, even you know, 71 pounds is not a lot to live on a week anyway. When you cut that by 40%, um, that's you're going to be struggling. And if you've got you know any other pressures, we're beginning to see people who are who are um, are getting into debt because of, of of benefits, and that's you know that's one of the biggest areas of, of debt that we're seeing increasing at the moment. So I, I, th I think you know that that is a real live issue. I think the other issue that I, I would probably flag up is is mandatory reconsiderations, um, particularly around employment support allowance. So uh, people who um, have decided to challenge their employment support allowance decision um, and can't get a payment during that that period. Um, if they are able to declare themselves fit for work, then they may be able to claim job seekers, but otherwise they, they, they're often struggling to get money. We've seen quite a few applications to the Scottish Welfare Fund as a result of that. And, you know, people are, are, are in some cases waiting weeks or even months um, to get a mandatory reconsideration decision made. Does anyone have any, anything they want to add that might not have been covered so far or something they want to add to, which was maybe mentioned earlier or even in the earlier panel that they want to come in. Ken, do you want to? I, I think that's a very key well, uh, Bill Scott, if I can. Bill, you mentioned earlier that 40% uh, of ATAS decisions are overturned. Um, and in, in the previous session, we heard from the SCVO that 60% uh, uh, of the Tier 1 reviews, or 59%, are overturned and 54% at Tier 2. What, what can we conclude or what should, what should we... What does that say about the system at the moment? It's like, I have to say it concerns me. Um, it's, it's difficult to say because the numbers are so low that are going to first tier and second tier um, but it, it does indicate at least the local authorities are prepared to reconsider um, uh, and, and, and do so relatively quickly um, in, in most cases there are some you know, lengthy waits for a review but in most cases they've been, they've been carried out relatively quickly um, and, you know, it's, it's a difficult one because obviously you want to get it right first time, but it is a new system. Um, and, and one of the advantages of the independent review service was, again, the directions that were given improved the quality of decision making over time, um, which is, is, is really important with a discretionary fund. Um, you know, to see somebody having an oversight and, and seeing, you know, where things are maybe going wrong and saying, well, you can sort that out by doing this uh, for now on, collecting this piece of information, etc., can be really, really helpful getting the decisions right in the first place. And, and, of course, the person who's in crisis wants the decision made as quickly as possible and it to be the right one. Um, but, you know, if, 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 it, if they're not receiving a payment, they're, they're going to want to see, you know, it reviewed quickly and, and, and a new decision arrived at. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that, you know, the local authorities, there is a lot of goodwill. There's some bad practice, but there is a lot of good practice as well. And, you know, I've, I've heard the local authorities where they are taking a very holistic approach with applications and actually, you know, uh, not sharing information, um, you know, without the applicant's permission, but sharing information with the applicant's permission so that other local authority services can come into play and, and help that person 
over the longer term rather than just in the crisis period that they're in. I absolutely agree with Bill. I think it's, it's about the balance between the need to make a decision and the requirement for evidence. And I got the impression from reading the transcript from last week that a lot of the local authority reps seem to be thinking you need evidence in every single case, even if it's the first time you've applied for a crisis grant. The idea that, you know, if you've applied three times this month because you've lost your wallet, they might want to see a pink slip from the police. And that seems fairly reasonable. But why would you, in every case, insist on evidence? And I think um, there is a potential issue with the bill as well, where it talks about two days after all the evidence required has been received to decide a crisis grant. So that's not even apply on Friday, decision on Tuesday. Apply on Friday, get evidence, three weeks' time, decision the following Tuesday. So there's, there's a real balance to be struck in terms of crisis grants. And I think potentially what's happening is local authorities are saying we have to have this kind of evidence to be able to award this grant to you. And that's not available at the time the decision is taken and then the person is aware of this because that's why the decision's been refused and they're getting it so you could reduce that amount by perhaps thinking more about what evidence is actually required and why it's why somebody can't get it immediately and hopefully make decisions both more quickly and more appropriately in terms of what you're asking people to get <laughs> Kevin, you want to be? Uh, I think um, it would be a bit daft of us to compare the Atos situation um, and the situation of, of, of these current uh, uh, grants from the Scottish Welfare Fund, mainly because uh, Atos and the DWP decision makers have got a fairly long time normally to gather up additional information or pre-information. And as has rightly been pointed out, um, folks need a decision in these cases very, very quickly. Um, again, if we look at the evidence uh, last week from the local authorities, we heard um, some hard point of views about e evidence ga gathering and some softer point of views um, and, and what was required. And again, I think you know we should go back to the local authorities and find out where be best practice actually lies. Um, because it did seem to me last week that two local authorities seemed to take a harder line than, than others who gave evidence here. And that's maybe just my perception of, of what was said. But, you know, again, I think one of the things which we, we probably need to look at is what is the mix of the folks who are actually carrying out uh, the initial stage of all of this? Because I, I think we'll probably find um, that there is a right mix in terms of the folks who are involved in their previous backgrounds to getting this almost right every time. Can I take the unique opportunity to actually agree with everything that Kevin just <laughs> said? Uh, wow, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the secret to success in this may lie within practice and local authorities, and we do have the interim legislation that's been in place, and it appears that there is mixed practice and mixed experience, and I think best practice is probably out there if we look hard enough for it. One point in best practice. What, one thing that a lot of um, public bodies do um, uh, when, you know, when they're operating a gatekeeping system is, is put um, some of the least experienced and least knowledgeable staff on the, t on the telephone. And that's the wrong way to approach things. Anybody that runs an advice service would say that giving advice over the telephone is actually much, much harder because you do need to ask the right questions and get the right information right from the outset um, to be able to determine you know, wh where you're going to go with it. Um, so, you know, this is things people can learn from one another because on, on, I think if they put experienced staff, you know, in that gatekeeper role, you're much more likely to get good decision making at the back of them uh, rather than the other way around where people's been put off before they can actually get to, the, to actually make an application. Um, and again, as a disabled people's organisation, we would like to see Applic all applicants getting um, a decision in, in writing or an appropriate uh, form of communication for them, um, you know, uh, in, in line with their needs um, to, to understand what the basis of the decision was and, and uh, so. One final contribution from you, Duncan. Thanks, uh, 
I just said, the point I'd uh, make was to reiterate that the Harriet Watt research was done on behalf of this and looking at this fund, it didn't talk to one care lever. And just to reiterate this point that they've gone unnoticed really in terms of unrecognised within the use of this fund and how they access it. Uh, and I would like that to be reviewed and more than happy to work with the civil servants, etc., on that. But it also leads us to the other thing we've done. We've given a lot of evidence to Education and Culture Committee and recently the Equal Opportunities Committee uh, using care experience, young people themselves who actually live this. We can articulate a lot of the issues, but we don't, to a degree, it's not necessarily our own lived experience. And we're very happy to offer that to this committee too, or individuals within it that want to come out and speak to people who've been using the fund, uh, etc. too, in terms of how we could get that to work. That was just an offer we wanted to make. I'm sure there's other groups too, there's disability, etc. that would... Planning to do that on the 28th of October. That's good. Great. Okay. So, again, consensus breaks out all around, even between the Conservatives and the SNP uh, this morning. So, we've had a very successful session, I think. Um, I've certainly been well informed um, by the, the contributions from you all. So, thanks very much for uh, coming along. And, and as I said to the other panel, if having taken part this morning, you go away and think, I wish I had said that, or I've got more information, please send it to us because the, the more information we have, uh, the better we can uh, scrutinise and inform the, the process of the bill. Okay, but uh, thanks very much to everyone. I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow the panel to, uh, to leave. And we'll move into private session for our final item.